conflicts with the provisions of section 10 colon 4-8D of the Open Public Meetings Act, the date, location, and time of the commencement of this meeting is reflected in a meeting notice, a copy of which schedule has been filed with the village manager and the village clerk, the Ridgewood News and the record newspapers, and posted on the bulletin board in the entry lobby of the village municipal offices at 131 North Maple Avenue and on the village website, all in accordance with the provisions of the Open Public Meetings Act. A flag salute. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag. flag. To the flag. United the United States, States of America. America. And to the Republic. And to the Republic. Republic. Stand. Stand. One, stand. One, One nation. Under God. Under God. Indivisible. Indivisible. With liberty. And liberty and justice for all. Okay, roll call, Jane. <clears throat> Mayor Newton? Here. Chief McGoyer? Here. Councilman Reynolds? Here. Mr. Joel? Here. Ms. O'Brien? Ms. Fatiri? Here. Ms. Huban? Here. Ms. Bartow? Here. Ms. Wessner? Here. Ms. Johnson? Here. And Mr. Lubarski? Here. Okay, welcome all. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. Our first item will be public comments on topics not pending before the board. And if anyone in the public, just raise your hand and Dylan will let you in and then you can just state your name and address. I... Give him a second. I am showing none. Okay. We'll move on to committee commission professional updates for non-agenda topics. Do we have any updates? I have nothing. Okay, seeing there's none. Uh, Jane, have we received any correspondence? I received two emails regarding the uh, um, Hopper application and notified them both of the hearing Okay. And, and the sign in information. Okay. And could you just file them in correspondence? I did, yes. Thank, thank you, Ms. Wonderjump. All right. Number three on the agenda was Fourth Morn Acquisition 121 LLC 235 East Ridgewood Avenue, Block 3703, Lot 11, Application for Minor Site Plan and Park Invariance. This item is being carried to December 15th without further notice and without prejudice to the board. And um, Mr. Joel, uh, that is exactly correct. There is a separate and distinct uh, aspect of that subject property. A little out of order now, but it might be a good idea just to address that at this point. Sure. And that's, uh, we kind of bifurcated the two elements for it. We're going to be reviewing a resolution, which is item agenda number five. And that was just for the facade renovations. And then the other aspect was the uh, minor site plan and uh, parking uh, variants. And that will be heard as a separate application, but it's part and parcel of the, the general application overall, but it's another element. So that'll be carried to December 15th. And the resolution uh, that I put together, um, you know, speaks for itself, but the two highlights are on the west side, if there's any encroachment by the facade on the west, west side of the subject, um, that would then require a stoppage of any work and addressing a potential encroachment agreement with the village. The other um, significant issue was screening in terms of any mechanicals and the roof area. Um, and aside from that, I believe the, um, the rest of the facade portion, which is that resolution, uh, is satisfactory. Okay, oh, I just got a it. question. Did, when did we get that resolution? Because I don't recall seeing it. Did any, everybody else have it? Yes, it was emailed out. Uh, I missed one again. I, yeah, I did forward it, forward it to the board when you sent it to me. Do you know which date? Um, what day did you send it? On uh, Monday? I think it was yesterday. 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 It was yesterday. yesterday. That would be Monday. Well, I forget the days myself, but yes. <laughs> Hang on, let me just 
Is anyone able to quickly email it to? I'm Susan? sending it to Susan right now. Okay. Yeah, because I actually don't think I see it. Did you, did you get it yet? Yeah, I'm, first, I'm looking for Jane's email. Melanie, wow. Melanie could you actually send it to me as well? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, my email is my name, Francis Borto at gmail.com. Okay, I have you right here. Oh, I found it. Okay, I'm sorry. 9.52 November 30th. I was in a meeting. Sorry, and I must have missed this and all my crazy emails. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sorry. Wait, I got it yesterday. That was yeah. the first. How did you get it? The 30th. Today is the first. Yesterday was the thirtieth. Well, we addressed really? the resolution. I guess we'll go through it. I'm going to bed. Um, <laughs> so, All right, I got couple. it. Thank you. I got okay. that's, that's the a resolution. Hang on. So that's the Hawthorne acquisition one twenty one, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. 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 All right, we're moving on to number four on the agenda. Um, I, I'm sorry. I thought you. I think you need to vote on the resolution. So oh. can, can we just have a second to read it? Oh, sure. Thank you. Apologies, sincerely. <laughs> Conditions specific to the application, Mayor, might be a good place to look to. Excuse me? Condition specific to the uh, okay. object. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I have a question, and I think I've asked this at a different couple of times. So when we are saying their plan detailed the encroachment or basically their measurements would suggest there was going to be the encroachment, they, I, maybe it's my brain, I don't know, but like, how did we end up where they said they wouldn't do it and, and who's gonna stop them or who's gonna be out there? It was only a foot, I think, or 10 inches or something. Yeah, it was not specifically shown that it would definitely be. Oh. But as, as you said, Melanie, it was definitely in a gray zone. Okay. So the issue is um, they do not want to suffer economic waste by ripping down a facade. So I'm sure the, um, you know, the borough officials, the construction officials will take a look. But I think it, it's in their best interest to identify exactly if they're going to encroach or not. They needed another variance if they were going to, am I right? No, it's, it's actually called an encroachment agreement, and it's not with the board review. It's, it's directly with the village. Okay. Yeah, I see that's in, that's in the resolution that they have to the and, and seek a, a, uh, an encroachment agreement. Okay. All right. I think I'm good. Okay. Hey, do we have a, a motion to approve okay. the resolution as written? All right, I'll move it to uh, be accepted. Do we have a second? I'll second. Oh, Jim okay. did. Give it to the chief. Jane, call the roll for the Quick. vote. Okay, uh, Mayor Newton? Yes. Chief Gore? Yes. Councilman Reynolds? Oh, she's on mute. I think that's the problem. Everyone's on mute. Yes, sorry. Mr. Joe? Yes. Ms. Huban? Yes. Ms. Pateri? Yes. Ms. Barto? Yes. Ms. Wessner? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. It's uh, approved. Okay. Our next item on the agenda will be Hopper Ridge Condominium Association, Block 4104, Lot 3. Application for major preliminary and final site plan, soil movement and variance approval. This is continued from November 3, 2020 without further notice and without prejudice to the board. The attorney on this would be uh, Dave Rutherford. Hey David, how are you? Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? Good. All right. I hope that you had a great Thanksgiving. It's back to work, right? Yes, for sure. <laughs> All right. So uh, I guess the uh, we had hearings on uh, October 6th and November 3rd on this matter. 
and you had your engineer Tibor Latinxis uh, testify. And uh, we had uh, at the November 3rd, we had a direct and cross and we were done with that. And were you gonna proceed with another witness or? No, Mr. Chairman, I think where we, where we left off uh, with Mr. And I provided for the record, I provided transcripts of both of the meetings Mm -hmm. uh, board and the board professionals. Um, I think we were, we may have been finished with board questions of Mr. Latinchich, uh, but we had not yet had uh, questions from the board's professionals and we not, had not yet had questions from the public. Okay. So I anticipated proceeding that way this evening. And then Mr. Chairman, at the moment, I really don't anticipate any other witnesses, although I do expect that as a result of the questions this evening from the board and its professionals and the public that uh, we may probably going to need some time to circle around and, and respond because I, I, I have a feeling I know what some of the concerns may be, but I certainly don't know them. I haven't heard them yet. Uh, so that was that. And then the other thing I was going to ask Mr. Chairman this evening, and I don't know if the board would be prepared to do this or not, but um, after the board professionals have questioned Mr. Lynch and before the public, I thought perhaps a few words from Mr. Ruthershauser with respect to the that might be able to set a little bit of context for this application that might be of assistance to the public in questioning Mr. Latinchich, but I'll leave that to the board and, and your counsel to determine how you want to do that. But I think for the moment, uh, I don't have any further direct testimony of Mr. Latinchich. Uh, the board, its professionals and the public have been extremely patient. Um, and I do know that the, that the public, uh, I, I expect a number of questions for him and, and I want to get to that. So I thought the best way to proceed this evening would be to Finish up with any further board questions of Mr. Latinchich, any further questions from the board's professionals, um, perhaps a few words from Mr. Ruthershauser, and then Mr. Latinchich is prepared to uh, answer any questions that interested parties may have. Okay. All right. So, uh, board members, does anyone else have any more questions of yeah. the engineer? I do. Okay, sure. <laughs> okay, Mr. Latinchich is here, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Hansen, I believe. Uh, Kim Furbach, our reporter, has she been promoted? I'll promote her now. Thank you. All right, she's good. Just in case she may have a, from time to time she has a question, she can't hear someone or understand someone. So thank you. And Mr. Latinchich is here too. I, think, I haven't seen him yet, but I think he's here. He's the one is she, uh, screen sharing. And to right. confirm, is my video working? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chairman, I think if um, the board, I guess the first questions will be from uh, the mayor tonight, but um, any other board members uh, have any questions, then my suggestion is I would actually suggest that we swear in the board professionals and they can ask questions, but sometimes that uh, evolves into uh, their own opinions. Um, and then, uh, of course, the, the public can have their questions. Thank you, Mr. Martin. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, so I'm good? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Great, thanks. Hey, Tibor, how are you today? Okay. Great, great. Um, so I have a question, and it, it, it's not so specific. Well, it's a, a couple of questions. One is not so specific to your plan, but it goes back to um, 1982, 83, 1989, and 1990. And I observed in some of the documents that there was a deviation from the type of timber wall that was originally proposed to a gravity type timber wall on the, on the crib retaining wall, which was structural. And there was a stability opinion letter that was issued on 12689. And I, I wanted to know if you were familiar with that or if there was any, um, maybe David could answer, if anyone has access to that stability opinion letter that should have been um, submitted by, I guess, a structural engineer architect, someone. And, and if you want, could explain that to us. Okay, I am, I'm aware of that, uh, those sequence of documents. Um, I've seen some of them. Um, it is 1989, 90, that's uh, 30 years ago. But in short, I believe this, the situation was that the original plan uh, specified 
railroad ties, um, which is a generic term. And when the walls were ultimately constructed, and railroad ties are typically six inches by eight inches. Mm -hmm. And when the walls were ultimately constructed, landscape ties were utilized, uh, pressure treated southern yellow pine landscape ties. Um, and if you note, um, I have referred to them as landscape ties, or I have tried to. In many cases, people use the term, the generic term railroad ties, but there's a distinction, railroad ties being creosote treated and larger and landscape ties is what we are all familiar with from the Home Depot and local lumber yards. So a question, uh, it appears that a question arose that due to the substitution of the smaller dimension and lighter weight landscaping ties were the, were the walls that were constructed uh, sufficient for their intended purpose. Right. So then the question is, and I see because it says a deviation and it has a gravity type timber, but there was a, a stability opinion letter that was issued on, it appears to be 12.689. And I'm interested in having a review of that letter if, if somebody has access to it. Okay. I do not have that at my uh, fingertips to share. And I would have to go into the file. I think we would all have to go into the file. Um, I, I think that the stability analysis was performed and I would think clearly certificate of occupancies were issued. Uh, so I, I believe the matter was addressed, but I do not have that specific information at my fingertips. Sure, I only, I only ask because I think it's, it's relevant to this entire conversation about what happened, how, you know, what happens now with the railroad ties. I think, you, you know, we had that little back and forth about depriving oxygen deprivation and, and, and whether or not they would, you know, break apart. So, so for, for a number of reasons, I'd like to have a, access to that letter. And I think it's probably um, helpful for the board to review as well, um, that stability opinion letter. I, I think it's important that we understand because we have a lot of information here and it's a really big project and, and obviously what appears to be a necessary project. Um, so, uh, so I think it's important that we have that. The other question that I had, um, and I don't know if you can answer it now or, or something you'll have to go back and look at, you know, a number, many of the issues that are a, of concern are um, the access route into that location. And I'm just wondering, is there a temporary road that could be uh, configured that would give access to that space. Um, I haven't walked it for a while, so I don't recall um, how that might work. Uh, but I'm just wondering, have you have you reviewed that as an option, an access option, rather than coming through that um, right of way access point, whether or not a temporary road construction, uh, which is often done in these big projects, whether or not that's something that's doable. You clarify your that that's a question to me, Tibor speaking. Yes. Okay. The if you can clarify a temporary road from where to where. Well, a temporary access road that would allow access to the back to the to the project area, the staging area, in in rather than using the um, proposed route. Okay, and um. Okay, there is. I wouldn't call it temporary. There's currently a roadway and I can call up the photographs providing the access. Um, and, and it is the intent to utilize that roadway as it has been over the decades for other purposes um, on a routine basis by landscapers. When the, when the, it's my understanding when the village previously dredged uh, the North Upper Pond, the, that is what it was used for. Um, you are asking, could we build a temporary road from another access point? Yes. Is there an, what, what are the alternatives to that 
that approach? What are, the, are there any alternatives to that? Uh, yes. Um, one alternative would be from the interior, uh, but if you're familiar with the topography, there's a very large topographic hump, uh, which is problematic uh, for um, loaded trucks. Um, that is an alternative. Um, certainly at the south end, an alternative from the interior access would be coming in from Hopper Avenue, which is a public right of way. Um, that would entail a temporary stream crossing of the water course, which I'm pointing at. Um, and so that is an alternative. Um, but again, that would be a, 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 a temporary stream crossing, um, which we try to stay away from for all sorts of good reasons. Um, another access would be, there is the sewer line, which I'm tracing, the trunk sewer line, 15-inch um, ACP pipe. Um, many would say that clearing and grading that would have a benefit uh, to, the, to the village for routine maintenance. Uh, but our, our perspective is if it's utilize what is in place and what is readily available, um, which is um, coming from at the south end from Daniel Court, a circular motion are around um, these units um, and the access uh, from Cedar Avenue. Um, I will add, I know you didn't ask this question, but I will add taking the opportunity there was a concern on uh, noise and backup beepers. We are making, we are configuring the plans so that there's a circular motion um, for all phases of construction, which would reduce, in theory, by a factor of two or 50%, the uh, utilization of backup beepers. Um, which are real prudent and required, but we're making sure we are having circular access around uh, for all the phases of construction. Um, but getting back to your question, yes, there's alternatives, but if there are, we are trying to work with the readily available alternatives. So, and just again, going back to now your circular to reduce the Oh, they're actually called emergency reverse audible. What do they call the beepers? <laughs> there must be a technical term for them, but I don't know. Maybe the chief knows. I don't know. Does anybody know the technical term for the backup beepers? Um, so did you, do we have, I'm sorry? Aren't they called backup beepers? Well, <laughs> if you think that's the technical term, we'll go. I don't know. Commercial yes. warning devices. What, what is it? Commercial vehicle warning devices. Oh, oh yeah, actually, commercial vehicle warning devices. We should come up with an acronym. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> so do we have a? Do, have you given it, that document to us? Do we have a, that proposal for the circular um, path to avoid that beeping? Motion? Okay. Well, my best example is is plan sheet four of eight on on everybody's screen. It's, it's every, I just I just shared uh, plan sheet four of eight. Okay. Is that a really? That? Is it very tiny? I'm not sure if maybe if this bookmark section is closed over here, maybe it might be a little bigger. I don't know if it's tiny for everybody or it's very. I have a pretty big screen. Yeah. It's full size on my screen. Your bookmark section over to the left side of your screen is open. I don't know if you could uh, Yes, out. it is. Okay, let me close that. that. I don't know if that'll leave. Yay, that helped a little. There we go. Thank you for that assistance. Thank you. No worries. Okay. Okay, for example, this is plan sheet four of eight, which is at the south or lower pond uh, off Daniel Court. Our uh, primary access road is, uh, our temporary construction road is, is uh, along the south side of the building. Um, and then material will come in via the south side uh, behind the wall. 
and exit um, through on the north side of this cluster of four units. Now, there is private landscaping here um, that is going to be disturbed and I presume in the future restored. I use the term private because that was installed by a unit owner as opposed to the association. Um, but you can see this circular motion will, uh, is, is just very practical. Um, uh, we do not have that extent of detail at the north end, but we will address that. So I don't know if anybody else has questions right now. I might have a few more after. Is there any way to have some of the construction vehicles go through Girar Avenue to kind of spread out the load um, in the area? Uh, well, I, as a practical matter, they shall. Um, the, for example, um, the, let me just, uh, certainly, for example, to, yes, the, sh the short answer is yes. For example, at the, the south end of the site, the primary access will be via Durar, not Hopper Avenue, for example. And will that just serve that southern part or will it also be able to serve service some of the uh, northern parts there? Yes, as, as a practical matter, um, the, for example, the, the, where the wall comes around to, let me, let me. For example, this, this, this portion of the wall adjacent to the pool, one could anticipate as a practical matter, some of the material will be coming in via Durar. Uh, yes. Can you um, say for a percentage, the vehicles like, say there's 100% of the vehicles, what percentage are gonna come through the Daniel Court, which through Durar, and which ones through uh, by Cedar Avenue? Can you? Okay. Um, Okay. Again, I'm the design engineer, mm -hmm. not the general contractor. Okay. Um, and if we break it down, for example, the um, the southern wall is it's seventeen. It's basically about thirty percent of the project. So thirty percent will certainly come via Durar. Um, I would anticipate another, certainly another 10% uh, Durar. And again, the circular motion we're talking about um, in the, the middle wall is from Durar um, and in a clockwise uh, manner exiting by the pool house at the North Pond uh, off the access road. You have circulation all around uh, the North Pond setting that culvert, and this was a question by a, um, a I believe a resident uh, at the last meeting. Yes, the uh, replacement reinforced concrete pipe will be set early in the construction sequence at this pinch point to accommodate the circular motion about the middle wall and the north wall. But getting back to your question, I would expect 30% of the material via Durar for the southern wall, um, certainly 10% for this uh, middle wall, uh, and the remaining 60% or so uh, via the um, uh, Cedar Avenue access. Okay. Any other questions for C4? Just that sheet is four of eight, is that correct, Tibor? Uh, on the screen now is sheet three of eight. And then four of eight was what you addressed with the mayor, correct? Correct. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions, I'll have our professionals ask questions. Mr. Rodas are you there? 
Yes, I am. Raise your right hand. Swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Yes, I do. And again, um, Mr. Rutherford, you stipulate to the village engineer's professional engineering capacity. Yes, I do. Absolutely. Okay. You're sworn and qualified. Uh, you can obviously ask questions first, Chris, but if you're giving any statements, you're covered now. Okay. Uh, just a couple questions for Tibor. Uh, with those alternate routes that you just illustrated for the board members, uh, would those be the usual tandem triaxle size vehicles or would you necessitate a smaller vehicle? Uh, preferably tandem, particularly for the crushed stone and the uh, select fill that needs to be imported. Um, and of course, there'll be flat beds for the block delivery, uh, which carries 16 to 18 pallets per truck. Okay, so we're we're dealing with trucks around 72,000 pounds gross vehicle weight, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and the circular motion, were you able to see if you can get a circular motion utilizing the access uh, roadway off of Hopper Avenue? Um, the access off, Yes, we could. We would still have to build a whole road. Um, let me pull that plan up. Yeah, I don't know. I don't recall if there was enough yeah, that, at the proposed stockpile. Well, the problem is, is that, you know, it's, it's circular from a remote here. It, you know, it, it's a closed circle. Hopper Ave, you, if you entered from Hopper Ave, exited by either leg, then you basically have to drive totally around leave the site, drive around the block to get back to Hopper Avenue, it would be very inefficient. Okay. All right, uh, nothing further at this time. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mary Ann. Ms. Bucci-Cord, are you there? She might be muted. I'm mute. Sorry about that. Yeah. That's okay, can you, can you raise your right hand? Sure. So we're to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. And Mr. Rutherford, do you stipulate to the village planner's credentials as a professional planner in the state of New Jersey? Mr. Rutherford? Oh, is he muted? Oh, no. David? It looks like he froze, he froze up. Yeah. Well, let's just wait a quick second for him. I'm yeah. sorry, I just lost... Oh. Screen share on it. Yes, I do, Mr. Martin. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Mary Ann, you can ask any questions you you would like of Tibor. Um, I guess I, I my questions are going to be minor because there's um, most of this application is really logistics and engineering. Um, since a lot of what's going to be actually visible is internal to the project. So one of the things that um, I pointed out in my review and I'll raise again um, is that the landscaping uh, component um, is really going to hinge on field discoveries or field changes or things that are, you know, that, that, that happen during construction. So one of the things that I asked for is to have that um, provided um, for, internal review at the end of project to be sure that um, what's expected will be there or if there was any unusual construction change, we'd be able to um, review it. The other question is, um, given the, um, the look of the project and, and, and how, how, how the landscaping is internally, even though it is an engineering function, it's still visually attractive. Um, my question to Mr. Tibor and, and to the attorney is if there is any objection to using a landscape architect for this when the time comes for the final landscaping plan. The, uh, I, I certainly do not have any objection. Um, I, I would only ask if that could that be expanded to, does it have to be a licensed landscape architect or a competent landscape designer or 
Um, I think I think a licensed landscape architect for this a project of this size and and scope um, would would be would be appropriate. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak with my client. I, I understand that the concern for sure. Uh, before I commit, I should probably speak with my client, but but I understand that we'll take that seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's my only question. Okay. So, All right. I so I guess uh, the public can ask questions now of uh, T. Bourne, the engineer. So uh, if anyone wants to ask questions, they could uh, raise their hand. Dylan will let them in sequentially, and you'll state your name and address, and then you direct your questions to Tibor from his testimony. This isn't public comment. It's mainly the ask him questions regarding his testimony and anything relevant towards this application. But can I just ask a question first? I'm sorry, I was trying to interject, but I guess you didn't hear me. Um, sorry about that. to, that's all right, no worries. Um, I just wanted to ask Chris a question. Um, our actually engineer, Chris Rudisauser. Chris, just so uh, everyone understands, could you just describe a tandem triaxial duct so that the, everybody understands exactly what that is? Uh, a tandem, tandem and triaxials tandem. are two classes of dump trucks. They're the uh, heaviest types of dump trucks. Triaxial has a gross vehicle weight generally of 80,000 pounds. That's the chassis, the truck itself, and whatever payload it's carrying. A tandem is generally registered up to 70 or 72,000 pounds. Uh, a tandem is two rear axles, one front axle. Triaxle has three rear axles, one front axle. Uh, triaxle usually has a third, the third axle usually can be raised and lowered depending on if the truck is carrying a load or not. Um, when the third axle is down on the triaxle, their turning radius is very much constrained. Uh, they need a much larger turning radius to make maneuvers so forth. And that weight is with with the load on top of it, whatever yeah. the load may be. And um, I forgot what I was going to ask. Never mind. Thank you. That is, you are correct. It is complete. The 88,000 and 70, 72,000 is tr truck. It's the full truck, chassis, body, engine, whatever, plus whatever load it is transporting. Presumably these are are they going to be doing, I'm guessing that what we're carrying in and out of here is relatively heavy. So it, is it likely that it would be more truck trips because it's heavier weight per load? Or is this something that with the, that size truck, they should be able to get away with less trips uh, with this amount of material? Those, those trucks are the most efficient ones for transporting the material. The drivers <laughs> have to be careful to make sure that they are not overloaded because um, an overloaded ticket is very expensive, um, and there are scales out, portable scales, law enforcement uses them periodically to make sure such truckers are running legal. And then just again on that turning radius, so in your, you're comfortable that if there were, there's no issue with any of that on the turning radius? Yeah, that's why I asked uh, uh, Tibor earlier this evening if he felt that he might need a smaller truck because uh, the turning radius might be tight, uh, right. but he feels he can use the tandems, maybe triaxles, get the maximum amount of load out on each cycle trip. So, but is that something that we should establish before? Because on a maximum load on a, if the, if the turning radius is appropriate and it works, then we have less loads going in and out. But if it turns out that that's not doesn't work and, and that there's not enough space there, then that means there are more trucks with more loads going in and out because that means we have to revert to the smaller vehicle, correct? Um, again, if the turning radius doesn't work and also it depends on the contractor, the contractor may elect, uh, he may only have a certain size truck in his uh, fleet. He may not have the largest capacity trucks, you may use a smaller one, you may use a single axle. Again, that's usually called means and methods for the contractor. Uh, but to your point, you are correct, that would run in, would result in more actual number of loads in and out, but of smaller vehicles. So what I'm asking then is, notwithstanding the, the contractor, whatever vehicles they have accessible, 
wouldn't it be important to establish that the um, that radius there's enough sufficient space there for that turning radius in the event that because that would be really the most efficient and least burdensome to the neighbors as this project moved forward because that's just less trucks it's just a more efficient process so before moving forward wouldn't it be like important to establish that that the space is there and that the turning radius is is doable uh, that would be up to uh, the applicant's engineer to confirm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm asking, don't you, but I mean, I guess I'm, it's a kind of, I guess a little rhetorical question. So I guess I would be interested in, in knowing, having that information and seeing that as a diagram to understand that that's, that works, that, that the largest truck, because that, that shortens the duration of the project it's it's less impact to the neighborhood it's less trips it's it's just more efficient uh, let me let me jump in here T, uh, tibor speaking uh, again to give a practical there is no problem maneuvering large trucks on this site this site was set up for access by fire trucks it's it's very clear but let me give an example for example, delivering to the south end of the site, what I fully expect the uh, competent truck driver to do is pull down Durar, front into Kira Lane, and back up Daniel Court and drop his load of crushed stone or a select fill for ultimately to be transported to the wall site by skid steerers. That is what is going to happen. There is no problem maneuvering tandems or triaxles on this site. This site was set up for fire trucks, um, and uh, there is not a problem. It is uh, presuming competent uh, truck drivers, and, and certainly anybody delivering quarry material is one. Um, the block delivery. Uh, which will be a, a large truck with 16 to 18 pallets of block material. Um, I, again, I fully anticipate, for example, at, at the south end of the site for them to uh, front into a Kira Lane and back up uh, Daniel Court to unload so they do not have to turn around at the end of the cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. um, moving vans come into the site I'm presuming on a periodic basis, no different. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, I guess we're moving into cross by the public. Uh, Dylan, was there anyone that raised their hand to ask question? We do, we have two. I'll bring in the first person. Sure. It's showing up as Horbart, Horbat. Bringing them in right now. All right, he's currently muted. And his video's off. Hey, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Hey, we're the owners of 388 Cedar Avenue, which includes the vacated paper street that is no longer a street and no longer meant to be accessed other than for absolute emergency purposes. Even the fire chief said he would not put an 80,000 pound fire engine down that lane, okay? Um, Mr. Horback, can you just give us your first name? I got everything else. Robert and Eleanor Horback. Okay, we could uh, got to take one at a time. So Robert, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, the, the deed, there's a deed of easement that was prepared by the village of Ridgewood that, that specifically states that it would be used for maintenance and repair in the event of an emergency. And it further says that no nuisance shall be created by any act that will be detrimental to the said land or to any property adjoining the land. Furthermore, you're talking 60% of 325 loads of just stone, plus all the other materials that would have to come 
through that they're trying to say should come through that access off Cedar Avenue. Uh, Robert, you got to frame your uh, as a question to the engineer. You might want to just say, are you aware of the easement and have him answer your question. There will be a public comment uh, part of the presentation where you make public comment, but just frame your uh, your statements as questions to the engineer. Could you spell your name, please, Mr. Horvath? Robert. Spell your last name. H-O-R, be like in boy, A-T-T. -T. Thank you. Could we just quickly let the public know for people that are new to the meeting, just how this works, not to post questions in the Q&A, maybe just quick uh, mention. I know we've done it a million times, but maybe okay. just quickly. Uh, all questioning will be done when you're let in to present your questions to the engineer. You shouldn't be posting any questions on the chat or anything like that. It won't be responded to. No, that, that's not part of the hearing record. So whatever is testified to here through the uh, video and audio will be part of the record. So if you have any questions, you raise your hand and eventually Dylan will let you in and then you'll be able to present your questions. And in this case, Tibor Latinxis is the uh, witness and that's who you're gonna ask questions of and you ask questions that are relevant to what his testimony was. So uh, Robert, you had certain statements and they can be framed in the questions, asking them and getting at you know, the information that you want. Okay. Yeah, let me just emphasize the question and answer section of the Zoom proceeding will not be addressed. So any questions in there uh, will not be responded to. Uh, it has to be done when you're admitted either uh, by phone or by Zoom connection. Go ahead, Robert. Tibor, if you look at the photo that you have of the uh, easement from Cedar Avenue, you will see a large tree on the right-hand side. There's no way, in, in my opinion, that you can have trucks access that right-of-way without actually going on the, the actual property. It's not wide enough. Number one. Number two, you mentioned the stream of, off Hopper Avenue. My understanding is that stream is 99% dry and could be used as an access. And you have stated that you could use um, access from Durer and, and that end of the property. You're going to have 12 foot wide space between the old wall and the new wall which gives you plenty of room to run trucks. Now it might be a little more expensive, but why should all the neighborhood have to be, have problems when you could access everything through uh, Hopper and, and, the sewer and, line. and the other problem is the sewer line. There's a lot of concern about that sewer line. And if that sewer line breaks with all the heavy weight that was never designed for, that could be a catastrophe. EPA, everybody would be involved in that. And what assurance can be given that um, we would not be uh, harmed with that? Okay, uh, Tibor, can you respond? There was many layers to it, but to the best you, that you can. Okay, um, if you don't mind, if you could repeat specific questions and I will, um, answer um the first question would be hopper avenue you said there's a there's a stream that you would have to overcome my understanding is that stream is 99 percent dry 90 but um yes um it is i'm sure it was flowing yesterday uh but during uh periods of low rainfall uh there is no discharge from these uh detention basins uh, okay. Nevertheless, previously, it previously is in your testimony. It, never, nevertheless, it is a regulated resource. So, if one was to cross it, no question, a temporary culvert would be required um, with the attendant DEP uh, permits. Did I did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. In your previous testimony. Uh, a couple of meetings ago, you had indicated that it would be possible to do this project through the Hopper community. It would be more expensive, 
but it could be done. Uh, yes. Um, and that would be being done without using the access from Cedar Avenue. Uh, yes. If, if there are there are alternatives, yes. Uh, typically uh, more expensive um, and there is an obligation on all parties to uh, do things, to do manners in a cost effective manner. Hopper Ridge is the only benefit of this project. Why should everybody else have problems and, and inconveniences and costs to make it more convenient for Hopper Ridge? Okay. Um, the, uh, I disagree with the statement of problems. Um, it, I have up on the screen, I believe, and that is plan sheet three, three of eight, the sheet numbers, but it, it's very, this access point to my understanding has been used by decades. It's, it's, there is, a, I'm pointing to a photograph of it. There is a curb cut with a concrete apron. Um, there is, uh, and then the photographs of the access roadway, which has been used for similar work in the past, specifically uh, the prior uh, cleaning and dredging of the pond by the municipality. That That's is not the true. Intent, to my understanding, that is the intent of this access roadway. Um, they, never used, they never used the access when they constructed the, the condos, and it has not been used for dredging. And if you look at that tree in the picture on the right-hand side that is in part of the right-of-way, that it's you cannot put trucks through there without going on the actual property. It's impossible. So the, okay, the access is on plan sheet three, the access roadway is detailed. I'm tracing the traveled way, the tree that Mr. Horvat referred to is here. And it's very clear that the traveled way uh, goes around the tree. We I'm have- Tell them, tell them, we own to the middle there. We have walked this property with truck drivers and uh, confirmed that it is suitable for access and maneuvering. Are you, are you familiar with what the term of an easement is and to be used only for emergency and not to create any problems? This is from the village of Ridgewood. This was prepared by the village of Ridgewood and it was signed by the attorney, um, Anthony, Speranzo. Anthony Speranzo. And it says no nuisance and at no act of any detrimental should be say, made to the land of that property. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to interrupt here just, just with a legal objection. Um, I, I think the adjudication and interpretation of easement agreements is something that's clearly beyond the jurisdiction of the board. Uh, Mr. Horvat is referring to easement agreements that appear of record um, that uh, grant certain rights to the village and also grant certain rights to Hopper Ridge. Um, and from our perspective, the terms of that easement does give Hopper Ridge the right to access that easement for this particular project. That's our position. It is our hope to work something out with Mr. and Mrs. Horvat in a mutually cooperative way that would enable us to use that easement. But I don't think that the board really doesn't have the jurisdiction to make any determination as to the validity, interpretation, effect, rights, and liabilities of the parties, etc. So I think further questioning of Mr. Latinchich on this issue is really pretty much irrelevant to the issues before the board. I have a question about this for either Ms. Chris or Mr. Um, Rutherford. Would that ease, whether or not we would interpret the language in that um, easement agreement, would, have we been, were we presented with um, any documentation about it existing in our records? Because this has gone on, it's been for so long, I'm sorry, I don't recall. So I'm just wondering, were we, were we or should we have, or would it behoove us to be notified? Uh, of I don't that? consider it. Yeah. David, if I may, um, Melanie, if, if they're relying upon an easement, it has to be a valid easement. And if it's not a valid easement, then they can't use it in terms of their ingress and egress. So it's up to the applicant to 
represent to the board that the easement is valid and sufficient for the purposes that they're desirous to use it for. Um, that's we the interpretation of it is is limited to that in terms of the board because if the board's going to allow soil movement, there has to be ingress and egress. That simple as that. There, there, okay, there I, I have a I have a question. Uh, do, ha, are, I have just gone through every file I've received, and I do not see an easement agreement that was. That was my to. question. I think is did we receive it? I, I don't I don't see it in my we records, see, and I would like a copy of it. Would like to be supplied a copy of the easement agreement? That, that Mr. Rutherford, if you're going to use the easement, please supply a copy of the agreement, represent that it's satisfactory for the purposes that you need to use it for. Please confirm that we didn't, we have not received it, correct? No, no, you have not. You have okay. not. Uh, you have not. Um, and and it's primarily for the reason I just expressed that, that I think the, um, with, with all due respect, certainly, uh, the board lacks the jurisdiction to interpret the easement or, or anything else, uh, but I'm very happy to provide it. Um, they are of record. It creates an easement. Uh, it's, I think it's seven and a half feet on each side of the center line of vacated Hopper Avenue. So it runs across lot, lot one, which is Mr. and Mrs. Warpath's property, and lot 13, which is the property of Ms. Olcott. So I'm very happy, Mr. Martin, I'm happy to provide that. I had obtained a report of title for each of those properties which i'm happy to provide the other problem is the weight on the sewer line there's been some very serious concerns about putting over 300 trucks across that sewer line and if that sewer line is uh, broken um, th that's a catastrophic problem and they said well we'll put some stone over it and it should be fine but that doesn't give any guarantee that that amount of equipment going across that uh, would not create a problem. Okay, well, first, okay, the, I'm not sure where the number 300 trucks came from. Um, typically, we are anticipating for the overall project about 171 truckloads. Um, you have stated 325 loads of stone that would be in addition to all the tractor and trailers that have to bring in the fill dirt and then also the concrete through walls. So it's a lot more than 325 trucks and in you total. Stated that. You stated that in your testimony. Okay, I, I would have to double check that number based on my further analysis. I believe it's about 171 trucks. It's not uh, what you just, said. It's not what you said. Okay. I will check the transcript, Mr. Chairman, and we'll find out what Mr. Latinchik said. Okay, sure. The, um, and, and I think also we're talking about lots of different things here. We're talking about stone. We're talking about fill. We're talking about pallets of material. We're talking about a lot of things. So I'll, I'll check right. the transcript and we'll, pro we'll, we'll, we'll provide what he said. And they're all heavy trucks, even a hundred of them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Did, did you want uh, that number Mr. Horvath, one? Did you want T. Moore to express his opinion on the weight on the sewer line? Yeah. Uh, 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 the required cover on uh, piping, be it sewer, storm sewers, etc., is typically a minimum of two feet, which is provided um, in this case. Um, that being said. If the sewer line was damaged inadvertently, that would be Hopper Ridge's uh, obligation to uh, repair it. The sewer line is actually not under the access road for half the distance. Um, referring this, the this is the access roadway uh, shaded in gray. The sanitary sewer actually comes at in a peculiar route. Uh, to this first manhole, and then it is under the access uh, uh, roadway, just to be clear. Um, but the uh, sewer line, which was under the former Hopper Avenue, uh, was designed for a public roadway. Now, Hopper Ave ultimately was not constructed as a through road, uh, but it has more than two feet of cover which is uh, the minimum required for proper protection of piping. 
but it was important. But Hopper Avenue wasn't designed to be a through street with with 80,000 pound trucks going back and forth all day. I, I would like the village engineer who has mentioned some concerns about the sewer line. I'd like his comments about that. Um, the cover on the sewer line, as uh, Tibor said, is two feet. That is usually adequate. Given the loads proposed to be over it, we will be monitoring it carefully. Um, if that line was in the street, the streets would be designed for holding the 72 to 80,000 pound vehicle weight. Uh, fire truck weighs close to that much. Uh, moving vans and other trucks that service our residents have weights in that range all the time. But not 300 trucks going through a street like that at, at any given time. I mean, that's uh, completely uh, beyond what the normal scope of a moving van or a, even a fire truck going through there on occasion, not 300 trucks coming through. Mr. Is Chairman, I'm going to object to the continuing reference to 300 trucks. Mr. T, I'm not sure that's what Mr. Latinch had said, number one. Number two, he revised it this evening. And number three, he indicated that the truckload is spread around three different entry points. So, just for the record, uh, that's okay. just my comment on the record. Okay. All right. Chris, did you have anything else to add on that? Uh, the kind of truckloads, the, the truck quantities being discussed are commonly seen in the village. Our police department does a lot of traffic data counting and the vehicle counts they get on a lot of our roads, unless you're familiar with it, can be astonishing, but it's spread out over a period of time. The trucks that are coming in here are not gonna be all at once. They'll be a couple of, couple of an hour. They have to get loaded, they have to unload. They're not gonna be and that's something that we can also put into the uh, major soil permit. We can put language in it that says no more than one or two trucks can be waiting to be unloaded in this particular area given the residential neighborhood. Okay. I'd like to ask the, the uh, fire chief if he would bring a truck down a dirt road like that, 80,000 pound fire truck. The questions are to Tibor. The board member doesn't uh, have to address the question. Don't address that. <laughs> uh, the questions are, could, this is not the comment section. This is questions of a witness. You're not the witness, Mr. Van Gore. I'm directing you not to answer that. Okay, Tibor, I would just like to summarize. You had indicated that this project could be done without using the, the easement of Cedar Avenue. It might be a little more expensive, and the only benefit is the people of Hopper Ridge, not all the neighbors and everybody else who would be inconvenienced and potential problems from it. So if it costs a little more, but you can do it that way, you indicated it could be done. Okay. Yes. The answer would have to be yes, there are alternatives. It is uh, not a a small increase in expense. And there are benefits to the community with the, with the greater community with this, not just Hopper Ridge is benefiting from this project. These walls are integral detention basins. For example, if we could fill these detention basins and have graded slopes, the walls would not be required. These detention basins provide stormwater management benefits and water quality benefits to the village of Ridgewood and the Hohokus Brook watershed, which is integral to the town's master plan and stormwater management plan. So it is not just Hopper Ridge that is benefiting from this project to be clear. There is 60, approximately 62 acres draining to these detention basins. Hopper Ridge in its entirety is only 10.3 acres. So these detention basins provide a benefit to the greater community. Any further questions, Robert? The fact still remains 
there's a potential problem. Our property is lower than the sewer line. If the sewer line breaks, it's going to go right into our property. Okay? And again, it, the, the project could be done without using that. You stated that. Okay. My concern is not your cost. My concern is the safety and uh, not being having the problems with, with the, the sewer line. Area. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does that finish your questions, Robert? Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we will submit in writing at the appropriate time and when it's a time for public comments. Okay. Uh, you don't submit in writing, you give uh, testimony if you're going to give public testimony or public comment uh, on the, uh, the hearing date. That's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Okay. Is there another person from the public to ask questions? Yes, we do. Hold on one second. I'm bringing them in. All right. Next person is Thomas Olson. I'm bringing him in right now. Mr. Olson, please unmute. There you go. Hi. Uh, spell your name, please. Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, Olson, O-L-S-E-N. Thank you. Okay, your address, please. 380 Cedar Avenue. Okay. I'm uh, just on the other side of the Alcott's. They're on, they're on the other side of the easement from um, uh, Mr. Hobart. Okay. You can ask questions of uh, T. Burla Tinkskis. Okay. Questions go. Okay. Um, I have a feeling some of my questions aren't can't not be answered. Probably better questions for the general contractor. Uh, will there be heavy equipment or trucks parked or stored on Cedar Avenue either during the day or perhaps even overnight? There will be no parking um, overnight, certainly, or or long term parking on Cedar Avenue. That being said, if a truck has to wait to make the turn into the access road, they'll, they'll be there for a short period of time, but there'll be no storage on Cedar Avenue. Okay. Uh, the construction crews, will, they, will any of them be parking on Cedar Avenue, their personal cars? No. Okay. Uh, Cedar Avenue was just paved last summer. Do you anticipate any damage from these X number of 80,000 pound trucks driving over it. I, based on what the, the town engineer said, it seems like the roads are capable of handling that. But again, this is a, you know, quite a few trucks. We're in a disagreement on to the number, but I also do remember you saying in the neighborhood of 325 truckloads, just for the record. Um, <clears throat> okay. So what is that so going these, to these are These are roadway legal trucks. Um, as a matter of fact, they are weighed before they leave the quarry. Um, and uh, it's normal and customary truck traffic. Okay. The, uh, at a previous meeting, you mentioned that the, uh, I believe that the, uh, the middle pond and the northern pond would be drained uh, prior to construction. And there's going to be pumps running I assume those pumps will be running 24 hours a day. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, any idea on how loud those pumps will be? Um, I do not have a decibel uh, a rating. Um, and um, the ones running overnight would be electric pumps, um, which are certainly quieter. Um, but I do not have a decibel rating for those pumps. I can provide that information. Okay. The, uh, also at a previous meeting, you mentioned the, the dredged material that you referred to as wet stockpile will be stored until dried and then removed. Where is the storage of that going to take place? Okay. Um, I expect Mr. Um, Rutherford will speak to this. Um, the dredging of the ponds is being removed from the project 
primarily due to economic reasons. Um, however, um, if, the, if the Bergen County Mosquito Commission or the village decides to uh, participate in that uh, opportunity, um, we would like to be able to have the permits in hand um, if that opportunity presents itself. Um, and Mr. Rutherford can speak to this, uh, but the uh, large scale dredging of the ponds um, while we are making provisions for it as a practical matter due to economic reasons are not uh, be is not up uh, proposed uh, by the homeowners association. Um, there and will I can be, uh, jump in, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, and there and will be some there will be some limited stripping of the uh, pond muck, for lack of a better term, in the area of the wall construction. Um, a much smaller quantity, and. Um, as a practical matter, uh, that will be stockpiled in the primary stockpile area in the uh, south, um, to the south east corner of the site, as where I'm indicated. Um, that will be dried out, and the intent is to use that on site for landscaping, uh, for restoration purposes. For example, if you're familiar with the site, this bank um, to the east of the pool area is eroded and is poor condition, an ideal place to put that excess, excess soil. The stockpile area will be need to be restored uh, after construction is complete. And the plan is to utilize that soil uh, on site. Um, it needs to be dried and screened to some extent um, and we are proposing in the stockpile area. Okay. Uh, now you mentioned that they've, they're no longer going to be dredging out that North pond. Uh, something that I, I'm not sure if this is a question, but something you may not be aware of based on the slide that you have up right now, sheet two, uh, if, if you look at those, <clears throat> just to the North of the North pond, there's a, a small, uh, wooded strip. There's uh, you know, exactly right there, right where you had it. That entire strip right there, those, I'm just going to say those three trees, the pr predominantly three trees right there that you have marked, and significantly into Alcott's backyard and into my backyard, the North Pond actually extends well into our properties with every rain, every major rainstorm. Uh, yesterday's rain, I would say that that wooded section probably had two feet of water. Uh, that happens with every major rainstorm. Uh, most of the time it's gone in two to three hours. I believe uh, one of the recent hurricanes, it was there for three or four days. Um, just so I'm actually rather disappointed to hear that you're no longer going to be dredging that pond. I was hoping it would re alleviate that because that flooding has, has gotten worse over the 22 years that I have uh, lived here. Okay, well, let me, let me answer your question here and very familiar with that situation. As a matter of fact, I asked, uh, that was a significant rainfall we had yesterday. Yes, yes it was. And I've not had a chance to look up the, the total rainfall, but certainly it's significant. And I, in fact, I asked the association if they could uh, run out and take some photographs, uh, but I'm familiar with that circumstance. Um, and one of the reasons is looking at, the, the Alcott and backyard and, and yours, this was, I'm tracing the, the location of the original stream. Mm -hmm. That is that blue line um, I'm tracing with my uh, cursor. Um, and on the Alcott's um, home, I'm presuming when it, when it was constructed, the stream was relocated to what was then the Hopper Ave right of way. They filled the, the, the front portion of the property, um, but they did not um, fill the entire area. And then uh, I, 
now pointing at the original site plan for Hopper Ridge and it shows topography in that area. And I'm tracing these contour lines. There's a bowl, there's a bowl there. Mm -hmm. And these, I'm tracing these contours. And in fact, these are photographs of that exact area. Yes. Uh, this is the Alcott's home. No, no, that's not the, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it is. You're right. Okay, that's the Alcott's home. I'm the, the property line is pretty much right through the middle of this oak tree. You can see where their trampoline is. Yes. I expect this is that low tracked area, which I expect there was water sitting there yesterday. Yes. Um, and if you look at the middle photograph, you can even see it by eye. The topography rises up. Mm -hmm. This is that stockade fence, which is 40 feet in from the property line. This low area, low area water is ponding is primarily on Hopper Ridge. Yes. Um, and then the topography rises up to where the ponds are. Um, the answer here is cooperation. Um, really what people, what the Alcott should do is or right, well, what is needed here is an inlet. And yes, that's on Hopper Ridge's property, uh, or they could put it right on the edge of their property line. And there's two options. They could connect that inlet to the town storm sewer line or the town silt chamber. The only problem with that is if the silt chamber ever got clogged, which is part of its function to collect silt. Uh, if that got clogged, the 60 acres would then short circuit and drain into the Alcott's backyard and there would be, you know, a northern, northern pond. Yes. The other alternative is to construct an inlet in this low area and talk to the Hopper Ridge. Would they grant an easement uh, to connect to this pond, mm -hmm. uh, yet another easement. And, and this, this, what I'm indicates this whole corner is everybody has a common interest here. Everybody's joined at the hip due to the natural topography and access. So from an engineering perspective, everybody should work together. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all I have, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Olson. Um, is there anyone else from the public that would like to ask questions? Please raise their hand and Dylan will let you in. I don't know if this helps at all, Tibor or, or Mr. Rutherford, but I believe when you were discussing at our last meeting, I think it was 10-6 um, or one of the last meetings, the, I think when you were adding up the total of the crushed stone, the concrete box, select bill dredging totaled, 5,876 cubic yards of soil movement or, and your words, if you extrapolate that to truckload, 326 truckloads of material. Okay. Um, but at many other points, you commented that it was 110 truckloads of soil imported over a three month period. So I, I went back and reread through, but I believe that was everything totaled with the dredging after the drying and the removal, if I'm, I'm quoting you. So that may be where that got confused. Okay, well, since, and since that time, um, we'll double check some numbers, scrutinized matters. Um, presuming full truckloads of block, there would be 11 truckloads of concrete block. Um, there would be 39 truckloads of crushed stone, um, more select fill. So basically 171 trucks over 63 working, 63 working days. Those are the uh, items that are used to create the new wall. Yes. Um, so basically five to eight trucks a day is what we anticipate. Can you tell me those numbers again? I'm sorry, I just wanna compare them with what you have here. So if you wouldn't mind just giving us those numbers one more time. Okay, uh, actually, okay, for the concrete block, uh, presuming full truckloads, 
um, is 11 truckloads of concrete block. For the truck, and these are presuming 18 cubic yard trucks. For the crushed stone, it would be uh, 39 truckloads. For the uh, select fill and topsoil, 121 trucks. Uh, so basically, it, the total is, if you total it all up, it's 171 truckloads over 63 days, um, working days. That's presuming um, a three month construction period, including half days on Saturday. Um, as a practical matter, certainly a minimum of, of two to three truckloads a day. Some days it might be five to eight. Um, and, you know, uh, and, and the, on this, on such walls, when you have good access, a typical crew can, a c capable crew can lay about 500 square feet a day. With this site, it'll average probably at a hundred square feet a day. Um, you know, some days you'll do more, some days you'll do less, depending on the access and where you're working. But that just, that gives you an indication of the difficulty of this access. This will be proceed at 20% the rate of a typical project that has good access. The access here is just very difficult. Tibor, there's no, this is Chris Martin. There's no exporting that you considered in the trucks? exporting soil the wet soil from the site anything like that okay these okay that that is where the the, the disparity in the numbers are coming that's what i thought the prior the prior testimony and i would have to check the transcripts was including the export of the pond dredging due to the practical considerations and certainly the financial considerations primarily with disposing of that dredged material unless the Bergen County Mosquito and the village wish to join the project um, Hopper Ridge does not have the resources to dredge these ponds so yes half the truck in prior testimony I suspect half the truck loads were material leaving the site that is not the case um, with the project being scaled back. That being said, if that opportunity presents itself, um, we want to have approvals and permits in place. I, I have another question actually too. Um, Mr. Olson asked a couple of questions pertaining to the pumps. And we understand the pumps need to run all day and night. You stated that the pumps running during the night would be different than those during the day and indicated that the um, pumps running during the day would be, I'm sorry, during the evening would be electric. So my question is, what kind of pumps are running during the day? And then what is the decibel level of each? Okay, I, I do not have information on the decibel level. Um, as a practical, okay, just so the Let me. There's a manhole here. The the and all the the drainage from the sixty acres goes through the silt chamber goes through this manhole. So the intent is to use that manhole as a pump chamber. It's ideal. So these, the pumps running um, for overnight is gonna be underground in that manhole chamber. I, I don't think it's, it's gonna be barely audible, but we will investigate that. Um, that being said, um, it, in the morning, if the water level needs to be lowered, the, the contractor may fire up a, a larger pump, uh, probably driven off a generator, 
and they'll be the normal and customary uh, noise from from that work. Um, so it's loud. It's loud. It's, a generator running on the street to to run pumps of that nature that would be relatively loud. But it, you're saying at least it would be during the day. Correct. And this is it. It's going to be a normal construction site. If if a neighbor was framing a house and the framer was working off a generator, it's going to be no different. Okay. So Tibor, just let me ask a couple more questions. So the generator that's running during the day, how long would that generator run for how many hours in the day and how many days? Okay. Well, there's, you know, the, there's many variables here. You know, for example, the best example is, is yesterday's weather with that rainfall there, the, the pumps would not be able to keep up. Um, and you will. I'm not gonna, I don't want to go into the anomaly of yesterday's rainfall. That was, that was, you know, a highly unusual event, albeit my street flood. So I, I appreciate Mr. Olson's pain. Um, but just on a regular day, how, how, from, let's just say from a day, how many hours a day does the generator run? Because I have to tell you that that a normal and customary construction site doesn't have a generator running all day. Overnight. All day. Well, it doesn't have a generator running all day. So I'm interested in knowing how long all day, and then what is the typical decibel level of that of a generator? I I do not have that information available. Um, the, the plan is to lower these ponds well in advance of the construction and keep that water level down with the small electric pumps. Um, I think we need to have a level of specificity with the best and worst case scenarios. I, I think that in fairness to the folks, because this is, it's not a typical construction site. It's not, it's, it's not, it's a highly unusual project. I think we would all agree with that. Um, and so I, I think that in fairness to the folks, we need to have a, some, some specificity to that um, generator operating and pump operating and, and you know, presumably a generator is operating and that has noise and then the pump has noise. I don't know, actually. Um, so if we can get some some more details on that, it would be helpful. And then I also just wanted to go back to a, quite a comment you made during Mr. Olson's um, questions. You stated that the number of trucks was normal and customary truck traffic. But do you believe that that's, I'm, and I'm just asking because that statement kind of, I, I wrote it down because it was so, such an odd statement. Do you believe that that, that what's being proposed here is normal and customary truck traffic? Absolutely. We, we prepare soil movement applications on a routine basis in the office, appear before multiple towns, a typical single family home construction in Bergen County certainly moves 2,000 cubic yards of soil. And how many trucks would that be? Um, if it, again, presuming 18, that's 111 trucks. That is normal and customary. It goes on every day in Bergen County. Okay. Uh, just to piggyback on Susan, is there any kind of noise mitigation that could be done for generators. I, you indicated that the one pumps would be in the, uh, the sewer there, but is there any kind of enclosure that they have for uh, generator type pumps? Um, the, well, the generator gives off fumes, so you try not to enclose it. Um, but uh, uh, that can be investigated at, and positioning the generator at a certain point in time, you don't want your extension cord to be too long uh, because of the drop in power, uh, but that can be investigated. Uh, dare I say something as simple as putting it inside the silt chamber 
which is also below grade. Are there any people from the public that want to ask questions of the engineer? Yes, I have two more. Uh, next one is Roman, bringing them in. Yep. Roman, please unmute. State and spell your name. He didn't unmute yet, hold on. Roman, can you hear us? All right, please state your name and address. Hi, my name is uh, Roman Shapira. Uh, the address is uh, 366 Cedar Avenue. Spell your last name. S-H-A-P-I-R-O. Okay, Roman, you can ask questions of uh, Tibor Latinkas. I, I just have a couple of quick questions. So, suppose you decide not to use uh, Cedar Avenue. How much more expensive uh, would the project be? Could you repeat that? I couldn't hear what you said. Suppose, suppose, suppose you're not using uh, Cedar Avenue for access. Uh, how much incrementally more expensive would the project be? Yeah, again, uh, I'm not side subject. I am the design engineer, not the contractor. Just a ballpark estimate. Um, uh, I would say about one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay. And how many units are in uh, Hopper Ridge? Uh, I believe it's uh, thirty-two. I think it's thirty-six, Mr. Chairman. Thirty-six okay. uh, units and about a hundred residents of the village of Ridge would live at Hopper Ridge. Okay. Okay, and. Uh, can, can you, again, a lot of numbers were uh, uh, stated about the trucks. In terms of just uh, Cedar Avenue, how many trucks uh, in your estimation will go through on a working day? When, okay, the certainly a minimum of three, uh, but I would as much as five to eight as a practical matter. If, if once um, uh, production picks up. And this is just cedar specific? Well, it, it, again, it depends on the, um, how, the, how the project is sequenced. Uh, but for example, if they're working just at the North Pond, um, for example, if, if you're laying 100 square feet of block a day, um, ultimately that's, 44 cubic yards of material, be it block, crushed stone, or soil, which is two and a half trucks, realistically three trucks. Um, but there's going to be other material coming and going. Um, so the uh, one can anticipate a minimum of three, but five to eight trucks um, in, in a work area. And for example, and everybody would like this project to proceed as expeditiously as possible. Um, three market, three months is the target. That's presuming multiple crews. So that's to say that there could be a crew at the south end and a crew at the north middle, and then you're supplying. So that's certainly going to be eight trucks a day. Um, this is this is normal and customary uh, for construction. All right, so this is eight trucks a day for the duration. You're saying, and and you said sixty three, I think, working days. So that's already like five hundred. I mean, am I is is my math completely off? No, no, it's it's going to vary. Some days it's going to be two trucks. Oh, so, so, so like uh, the, the, the average, we're talking like three or four, yeah. so four trucks a day. Yeah, but that doesn't, but, but if there's two crews working, which would be to everybody's benefit, because the overall project is going to go quicker, there's going to be trucks supplying the south end and trucks supplying the north end. Okay, 
So it's going to be certainly a minimum of three trucks a day, but there certainly should be provisions for more than that. Five to eight is reasonable. For example, you, you, your most productive is the first three hours of the day. You want your crushed stone that you could be using on Tuesday morning delivered to the end of Drew or Ave, or excuse me, the end of Daniel Court at 4.30 on um, Monday afternoon. So on Tuesday morning, you can have Maximum. Okay, I think I, I get the idea. I don't want to take up uh, yeah. more of your time, but you're saying it's it's uh, basically three to eight a day. Uh, so so would would it be fair to say that the average would be a five five yes. a day? Yes. You know, more on certain days, more or less on on you know less on other days. Uh, so five a day. And you said sixty three hours, uh, sixty three days. So looking at 300 trucks, basically overall. Okay. Again, okay. I, again, it is. It's going to vary. It's going to be. It's 171 trucks, presuming fully loaded trucks, um, for the uh, material. Okay. Okay, and then the last question: uh, what, what is your intended hours of operation? For the for this project, well, okay. what are you proposing in terms of the hours? Okay, I I and then I defer to Chris. The ordinance, I believe, it's uh, seven to five. Yes. And the, this, half day Saturday. Normal normal working hours. I didn't hear what David said. I'm sorry. I believe it's also a half a day on Saturday. I think it's 9 a.m. or 9.30 a.m. on Saturdays till 1. Right. That's correct. I believe you're correct, yes. I thought on weekdays it's 7.30, not 7 I think it's 7.30. Mm -hmm. And may I ask, uh, and, and I guess this is for the playing board as well, does does the board have any control over it? Or if, if, if it's, or it's just, it just goes by ordinance? Well, the answer is they have to file the ordinance. So the board would require them to file the ordinance. If there's an exception to be made and the applicant would stipulate to it, the board can make some suggestions in that regard. When you say suggestions, you mean more hours or less hours? No, we don't mean 5 a.m., I would imagine. So I would, I would say the board might make some other suggestions as to the beginning time. Okay. Okay, thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you. And thank you, Roman. Is there anyone else from the public that wants to ask questions? Yes, I have one more. Uh, let me get Roman back into an attendee and then I'll bring in the last one. Uh, Kimberly Lock Wong. I'm promoting her right now. Kimberly, are you there? Can you uh, hear yes, us? I'm here. I'm here with my husband. Uh, hey, please state your name uh, and Kimberly address. Kimberly and Alex Wong, W O N G, 272 South Irving Street. Okay, you can ask uh, questions of the uh, engineer, and they should only come from one person at a time. Okay. Um, one question I have is he keeps um, referencing the construction team and I'm curious as to how like the construction crew team company was vetted and how they were chosen. And he's saying that this is like a really, you know, difficult project. So I'm just wondering what their background and experience is um, regarding this project of scale. I can answer that, Mr. Chairman, that the, while uh, uh, contractors have been contacted to gauge their interest. And as, as Ms. Wong indicates, they're, ability to do the job, no contractor has yet been chosen. Um, I think it's clear from Mr. Latinch's testimony tonight that there are lots of variables here. It's a complicated project and there's lots of different ways that it could be approached. Um, so, so the answer to that is no. Um, most respectfully, I don't really think the board has any, any uh, authority over who we choose. Uh, and, and I will say that by a follow-up to what Mr. Shapiro said just a moment ago as well, there are a host of regulations that are going to govern the manner in which this project is done. 
uh, not including the village noise ordinance, uh, the village ordinance with respect to hours of operation for commercial activities, the state noise standards, um, as well as the, the, uh, the village council's ability to craft uh, a, a very specific and, and carefully conditioned uh, soil movement permit. So I, I think the board and members of the public, I think, I think very legitimately um, can rely upon a number of those items uh, to, to ensure that this project is constructed in, a, in an orderly uh, fashion uh, so as to minimize the impact upon the village and the neighborhood in general. So and Kimberly, the, at the board attorney, there's a developer's agreement that if this is approved, uh, Mr. Rutherford and I, um, oh, I would put together, and it would have to be satisfactory to the village and the board, and Mr. Rutherford would have input on that. But those things include insurance, performance bonds, things to make sure that whoever does the project uh, either does it um, well, does it properly, or there's a there's um, abilities to make whole if there's any uh, problems with the project. And I, Mr. Chairman, please please be certain I was not looking to foreclose. Uh, the question from Ms. Wong. I, I wasn't. I just wanted yeah. to give a little background there. That's all. Oh, that was that was fair. It was appropriate. Uh, Kimberly, do you have other questions of the engineer? Uh, sure. This is actually her husband, and I know he mentioned three months, but is there is there like a longer term? It, I I know a lot of construction could you know obviously last longer, and I'm just trying to figure out if it's could could have extended six months. And then also, what time of year are you considering doing this? Is it going to be during the summer months, spring months, fall months? So I'm just trying to figure out because obviously we have very young children that go up against the back of this construction site. And with, um, with us and dust, everything else, I just want to see about that and like time frame and as well as pollution, how are you supposed to... How are you how are you going to minimize that as well well just for the record you're alex correct yes okay thank you go ahead okay well the yes the, the target is three months uh, and that is presuming saturday um and and yes clearly weather could impact that um i cannot there's not to sidestep the many variables here, but, uh, and I can't speak for the association, uh, but I believe springtime, um, early spring is the target uh, to initiate this project. Um, and uh, so as to, so it does not drag into the mid to late uh, summer uh, months. And then and the follow-up question was pollution. Have you studied that with the trucks and everything? I understand you're saying that it's normal course of construction business in, I think you quoted Bergen County, but this is gonna be very concentrated in that area, obviously, right? So, what, three, eight? Uh, you know, I think people are losing sight of the fact this is a 10-acre site, 10.3-acre site. We, we built similar walls on much smaller properties. So it is, it is, it is not, it's concentrated is, is a bad term. This is a large site. These walls are in the middle of the site, distant from neighboring properties. They're down in a ravine, natural ravine topography. I mean, these are all, you know, positive factors. Um, Many cases, these walls are totally hidden. Um, the um, obviously there will be dust control as part of typical compaction. You lightly moisten the soil. Um, the erosion control measures are. How do you lightly moisten the soil where you will be? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Just I quickly want to. I, I I wanted to take that note down. But where you are in the ravine, what? truck or hose or or hose equipment will you be using to moisten the soil garden hose a garden hose no, no you just lightly spray the soil you can't Wait from a garden hose down into the ravine that you're telling this gentleman is far removed 
from the site. So how are you hooking up a garden hose? Okay, the, we, but we are there directly adjacent to these, to the, to the in some cases, a few feet from these units. I, I you know, there's- Okay, so I'm saying, but that, that was my question. I'm just, so you're oh, saying yeah. you will use a garden hose attached yes. to somebody's unit, anybody's, just whoever's is closest to where right. you are, a garden hose. That, that's simple. Got it, okay. Um, erosion control and dust control is, is specified, normal and customary. Um, the, uh, the, did I answer your question? Uh, I, I'm more concerned about the control of, in, in the trucks as well, going through that path through cedar. Uh, so I understand the, in, okay. inside the, I guess, the ponds itself, or whatever you want to call those, the ravines you were mentioning. Okay, I cannot, I cannot come comment by, on on the trucks that some third party is supplying, but I'm presuming these are roadway legal inspected trucks, no different than all the other trucks that pass through Ridgewood. And the materials in the truck. Yes, no different. If a moving van. If there was people moving out of Hopper Ridge, or no, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the trucks themselves. I understand that. I'm just talking about the materials in the trucks. So it's going to be dirt. It's going to be dust, everything in there. Is that going to be covered while it's moving? Absolutely. And that is the um, that's a requirement that all trucks have a cover on them. The concrete block actually arrives wrapped in plastic. The pallets are wrapped in plastic. The con uh, the the uh, the crushed stone is actually washed be before it leaves the quarry. The truck is absolutely covered, and the same with the select fill. That is a basic requirement. And in terms of the noise you were mentioning, I know the pumps. We had we addressed that. Is there going to be drilling, like hammering, or? What like jackhammering or anything like that, or it's just really just uh, heavy machinery? No, no jackhammering. Um, there is uh, uh, there will be skid steerers um, and compacting equipment, vibratory plate compactors. Okay. And question, just generally in. Has anybody ever, has anybody hired their own lawyers from each of these houses? I'm just curious. To, their own to, what? Their own counsel or lawyers. Like if I could get my own lawyer to review everything and to ask questions, has, has anybody, has anybody a household do, done that? Just curious. Okay, that's not an engineering question. I would defer. I'm, just, I'm not asking, I'm not asking you. I'm just asking the board. Yeah, that's that's a legal question. You you're free to consult a, an attorney if you okay. want. Chris, that's you have great. anything to add to that? Yeah, nobody's filed any kind of appearance on behalf of any uh, resident, except the applicant on behalf of the association. Okay. A, a question for Tibor. Um, Tibor, you said that it was a th roughly three month project. 63 days, if I recall, mm -hmm. of two, two and a half months, the 63 day project. That's if there were two crews working at each end of the project. Is that what I understood you to say? Okay, the, again, that's, that's a means and methods question. We have uh, previewed this project with a list of contractors. Mm -hmm. um, and again, there's six, in round numbers, there's 6,000 face feet of wall. A good, in a normal project, it's 500 feet a day. This project, uh, as little as 100 square feet a day. Mm -hmm. um, production will increase as um, the walls rise up and access is, is improved. Um, the, but three months is the target. So I, I think my, uh, may, I, maybe my question wasn't clear, apologies. My question is, you stated that it's, I believe you said 63 days or three months, if with 
two crews, one on each end. No, I said there may be two crews. Okay, so, all right, that's fine. That's fair. You said there may be two crews. So my question then is this, so just bear with me. If there are not two crews, it, with two crews, obviously it's a shorter duration. So because you said it, it kind of, I just had made a note. What is the anticipated, I mean, two crews work differently together. You know, they, they, they each take up a, a piece of the project and, and maybe one follows the other along. I don't, you know, I don't speculate how that may happen, but the question is if, if the contractor doesn't have two crews, what does that, in your estimation, add to the timeline of the project? Okay. Um, and I ask because you said it. Uh, that's the only reason I, I ask if you can uh, ask. I, I, okay, the, I think in con, I think things are thinking statements are being taken out of context. I pointed out that when we're discussing tr truck traffic, if there were two crews working at extreme ends of the project, and, and that is very practical because the, you know, the separate walls, you're going to have more truck traffic on any given day. Um, the, we have vetted contractors. Uh, this office in Hopper Ridge is being very careful to hire capable, competent contractors who have the manpower and the equipment for this project. Uh, Hopper Ridge does not want it to drag on and on. That vetting process, and I think I previously gave testimony um, in addition to our experience with similar projects throughout Bergen County, we went directly to the manufacturer, Keystone Block, and asked them for their A list of contractors for a project of this nature. They provided us four of their A list contract of, or their A list, not their contractors, but contractors who purchase the block from Keystone and uh, construct similar projects. Um, and I believe we reached out to three more contractors. Um, and in doing so, um, this is not just, I also asked for input from contractors that matters that should be incorporated into this project and the planning so we don't have a problem, but I don't want, nobody wants to hear you should have, would have, could have the day after you started. So great care is being taken in that regard. Um, we, it is not gonna be um, a small scale contractor. Um, and uh, it's not gonna be a, a small scale landscaper building a wall of this size. Where um, it, you actually specifically said those virtually those exact words in some other testimony about their A list, their four to five lists, their list of four to five A list contractors who specialize in such construction. You've distributed the plans to them. Um, you're listening to them, the experience. You're incorporating their comments and their does, the, into the application. Um, but everywhere else, it states that this is a full three month project. And I feel like, I guess, this is the first time I'm hearing that it's a two month or a 63 day project, but full three months. Three months, three months is the target. Okay. Okay. But this approval should not, we have a week of weather like yesterday, you're going to, Hopper Ridge is going to lose a week. And I remember you saying that as well in previous testimony, it, it absolutely very clearly made yes. that clear that this, that, that, that's possible. Um, Go ahead. I'm sorry. I guess I'm, no, I'm... it is three three months is the target, um, and I think you know. Uh, I think gave previous tests. COVID is working against us. You know um, the the exodus from New York City is real. Excavators are in extreme demand right now. For people who are familiar with septic systems, to get a septic contractor today, uh, an excavator, their lead time is 12 to 16 weeks from now. 
That's the reality that we're the current new norm. So there, there's variables here. I, I pardon no. if I'm repeating myself. Three months is the target. Could it absolutely go four months with bad weather? Um, there's a supply chain in, uh, we all know that you can't, you know, there's a supply chain problem in plywood now. I have checked with Keystone. Is there a supply chain problem with Keystone Block? Right now, there is not. Um, hopefully, there, that will not, that will be the same situation in uh, the spring. Tibor, I just want, I just want to go on the record. I, I didn't think I took your comment or statement out of context. I just, I just was asking a question. If you, you know, in a best and worst case scenario, that's all I'm just trying to understand when, when um, Alex um, asked a question about the length, the duration and, and the pollution. And I appreciate, I know that the, the stone and, and the soil and the dust is, is mitigated through hosing it down. But in, in terms of pollution, pollution doesn't always happen just from stone dust, as, as he pointed out. It's truck pollution, it's noise pollution, so lots of pollution. You know, it's, it's variable. And so I was only asking a question. I didn't take, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think I took anything out of context. I was just trying to understand the best and worst case scenario. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Alex, do you have any more questions? Is he still there? No, we're, we're okay. Thank you. No, thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else from the public to ask questions? Yes, we have one. Uh, Mr. Horvat. Okay, uh, he's coming in right now. I have a follow-up question for uh, Tibor. Sure. He had stated in previous meetings that there would be 12 feet between the old wall and the new wall. And now he states it to be about 6,000 linear feet of wall. And, and he said that all that, when the, to complete the project, that they have to backfill with stone and then dirt on top of the stone <clears throat> is 12 foot wide, 6,000 feet long. Now you tell me how many loads of stone? He said 36 loads of 325 loads of stone. Is that, can he clarify that? Okay, the, the, Okay, the crushed stone behind the walls is uh, 30, 39 uh, loads of stone. And the select fill behind the walls is 31, <laughs> 62, 121 uh, truckloads. Um, and if people bear with me, uh, I'm going to see if I have some good pictures on a similar wall. I think it'll just pictures worth a thousand words. Um, I'm going to interrupt. I believe that the, the question had to do with 6,000. If I heard the question correctly, 6,000 linear feet. Yes. I don't think your testimony was 6,000 linear feet. Am no, right? 6,000 square feet of wall. Excuse that's me. That's what I thought. You okay. Divide that by 100, and that's where you get the 63 days, correct? Uh, Yes, yes. The length of the walls is 624 feet in total. The total square footage of the wall is 5,878, called it 6,000 square feet of wall face. Um, and there's 12 feet between the existing wall and the new wall. Okay, so uh, how many square feet of fill is there? to fill in and it's six feet high, 12 feet in width by 624 linear feet long. Okay, the, the actual quantity, um, bear with me here. Um, okay, it's 100, it's in, in 1993 cubic yards of uh, fill behind the walls. Um, and okay, this I just just maybe this will help. 
This is a very similar wall under the wall that we designed. Um, it happens to be in Saddle River, uh, articulated uh, modular concrete block wall. Uh, this happens to be Liberty block, not Keystone, but extremely similar. Uh, these are the, this is the geo grid behind the wall. And you can see that uh, there is crushed stone uh, behind the wall. Okay. Uh, I don't know if this is helpful for people. This is this wall rising up. Again, in this case is being backfilled with crush, crushed stone. There's actually, a bit, there's a, ultimately there was a zero edge swimming pool built on this wall. Uh, this is the geo grid behind the wall, which is the key element of these walls. The hollow core block is ultimately filled with concrete. Um, this is your, this is a, a compactor, which is compacting the soil. Uh, you can see the wall is rising up. Um, the crushed stone behind the wall for drainage purposes. This vertical piping is sauna tubes for the future uh, fence posts. Um, this is actually a drain here. You can see block is being laid out. In this case, we had very good access, so heavy equipment had no, no problems. Okay, now here is, this is, you can see why the 12 foot we're talking about. Here is the wall backfilled with crushed stone, a minimum of one foot of crushed stone behind the wall. You cannot drive heavy uh, equipment um, or vibratory compactors. In this case, it will be a much smaller compactor. Okay, but the, this select fill here is being compacted. The previous slides, the geo grid, which are effectively dead men, are extending into the soil and the soil is being compacted. Is this helpful for people? Here is the face of the wall. Um, uh, in this case, there was extensive drainage at the base of the wall. And there's the finished wall. Um, and this is a very similar, this is a blended block um, you can see there's a swirl texture, and this is the block that we're specifying here. It's, I think it's attractive. It's a, it's a split face block, a textured block. Um, and I'm not sure if you can see it, but there's, there's a swirl of gray and brown. It's really a blended block, um, which is very aesthetic. Um, and this is what the this finished product will be very similar. Uh, in this case. Tibor, how many photos did you just show? Yeah, uh, how many? I believe that was six. And uh, Mr. Rutherford, what, which, let's just mark these collectively as, what, what are we up to? That's uh, one, two, three. Yeah, six photographs. I couldn't, I'm sorry, Mr. Martin, I just didn't hear you there, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, let's mark this collect the six photographs. What what exhibit are we up to? That's a good question. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. Why don't we uh, mark them? With A1 to with the with this evening's date, is that okay? I'll I'll look at the transcripts and I'll provide it. Okay, well whatever it is, it'll be exhibit and then um one through six, okay? That's fine. I'll look I'll get the transcript and I'll get you the proper number. Is anyone else getting like that feedback? Yeah. Yes. yes, I did a moment ago. That's why I could hear Mr. Martin. Yeah, no, I know. Like, it's like really annoying. Yeah. Robert, has. do you have uh, other questions for Tibor? How many cubic yards per truck and how many cubic yards does it take to backfill those? Uh, my calculations are based on 18 cubic yards per truck and the soil such as this, exactly what we have here, um, is uh, 1993 cubic yards, which is approximately 110 uh, truckloads. So that's more than 39. 30. Uh, that's right. You had said 30. Previously. No, no, no. 39 loads of stone, and I have 121 select fill loads. 
That's correct. Fill in topsoil, 121. That's correct. If, if you look back into to the records from the November meetings, he said 326 loads. Okay, that's when we were also incorporating the dredging of the ponds. Okay. The total truck traffic anticipated is when we add up the block, the crushed stone, and the backfill. Block, crushed stone, backfill, approximately 171 truckloads. And you also stated that you use a garden hose to to water down and keep to keep the dust. Now, how are you going to do that? If in fact you use all the way out to Cedar Avenue, you're not going to run a garden hose out to Cedar Avenue. And that's a dirt road. Okay. The even if you put stone uh, over it, you're still going to have the dust and the dirt is going to be terrible. Okay, the okay. When I was talking about keeping the I was referring to the dust with this material right behind the walls. Okay. For the Cedar Avenue, no question, the contractor will have a water truck. And if the access needs to be uh, sprayed down, and that will be performed. And that can certainly be a condition of approval. So Mr. Rutherford, I, I just want to make sure the record's clear. Importing 39 truckloads of stone, 121 truckloads of select fill, that would leave 11 block uh truckloads of block is that accurate tibor or not yes yes uh yes 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 and that's presuming full that's a presuming full truckloads you know if if that's you know people need to be reasonable if there's a half a truckload of block coming one day there's gonna be an, an extra truck trip the next day um and just one follow-up question uh, along the lines of Mr. Mr. Herbert. Um, we, we've, I think you've clarified the record nicely in terms of it's not gonna, you're not going to have exporting dredging. However, some of the minimal dredging that is necessary for construction, is that going to be kept on site? The, the intent is to utilize that on site if possible uh, and practical. That does, should not be limited that if there is, uh, if, it, if there's good reason to export it, export should be permitted in the approval. This is normal and customary construction. So we would need to know what an estimate of that is if that was to be included. If not, that will not be in my resolution. I can provide that. We have, uh, uh, once again, give me a moment. If, and I'm using the word stripping, if, we, if we're stripping the muck uh, from the pond bottom in the wall area of the wall construction, and if all of that was exported, it would be approximately 12 truckloads of material. Um, there's a great benefit to drying it on site because the volume reduces significantly when you dry it on site. Um, and yes, it, it's nobody wants to do uh, truck wet slop because it seeps out the tailgate and makes a mess of the town roads. So it is prudent to dry it on site. And if it was to be exported it would, in its wet condition, it would be approximately 12 truckloads. Um, it is our, our goal to utilize that on site for uh, restoration and erosion control purposes. Okay, so the, the, uh, to be fair, the focus would be not to have any truckloads exported, but your estimate if needed and to factor into this application would be if needed, uh, a maximum of 12 truckloads uh, as you described. Yes. Okay, thank you. 
how long would it take to dry and what is the odor of the material when it's drying sitting there? Uh, the, well, as a practical matter, that material would, would uh, longer is better. Uh, we would seek the full three months. And uh, when, it, it, when it first comes out of the pond, it's um, one can anticipate some odor. I, I, I cannot give any technical information on, on odor. Um, but uh, that is uh, like to live next to it for practical matter. Would you like to live next to it for three months? Um, well, actually, I, I do. Uh, I live in a lake community, and we have a major lake lowering periodically. So, and and value the benefits of that lake lowering. Um, you know, because it's uh, good for the lake. So I do. Well, the neighbors wouldn't be benefiting from the smell of it, I'll tell you. Okay. Uh, questions? Any further questions, Robert? Or? Well, I think lowering the level of a lake is a lot different than dredging out a pond and putting the, the waste that muck. comes out of the muck out of the pond, piling it up and leaving it there for three months. It's a big difference. Okay. The it is very impractical to truck the material when it comes directly out of the pond. It is normal and customary to stockpile it on site, allow it to dry, and hopefully the goal is to utilize it on site. And that would reduce the truck traffic. The whole neighborhood with, with this material and everything else that's going on. And there's no benefit to anybody in that neighborhood other than the Hopper Ridge community. Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna, in, I'm gonna interject once again. You know, I, I've heard that several times this evening. Okay. And I indicated earlier, there are 36 families that live in Hopper Ridge, 100 residents of the village of Ridgewood. They have the same interest in ensuring that this profit project is done as expeditiously as efficiently uh, and with the least amount of disruption to the neighborhood as anyone does. This is going to take place on their property. I have as much concern about this as anyone. And I understand the concerns of the interested parties. I understand that and respect that. This is a big project and we understand that. But I think we need to keep kind of keep this in context here. If anyone wants to get this project done quickly and efficiently, it's Hopper Ridge. That's fine, then let them do it on their own property. Okay, uh, Mr. Rutherford. Do me a favor, Mr. you can make comments at the end, and yeah. Mr. Rutherford can make his summation at the end. I apologize for not limiting this earlier, but again, your questions are probative of the witness. Once you're done, that's fine with the questions of this witness. You can ask other questions of other witnesses, and when you want to make your position statement, you can make that at the end, and Mr. Rutherford can make his as well. Thank you very much. Okay. Are there any anyone else from the public to ask questions, Dylan? I am showing no other hands raised. Can I ask you one quick question um, of Tibor? Um, I just I had gone back over some of my notes while you were um, you, discussing the timeline and the targeted timeline, and I noticed that on our <clears throat> I think it was the November third meeting, and I'm sorry I didn't um, I didn't ask this a little bit sooner, but I just found the note. Um, we had, you had said that three months was the targeted timeline, presuming three crews for the three walls at 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. I think at that point you were still factoring in on seven days a week. And, and we had had some conversation about how this needed to be attractive to contractors because it's not an attractive project and whatnot. And I don't actually know that we ever came back, circled back around to I understand three months as a targeted timeline, but in your testimony, it was three months as a targeted timeline, seven to five, seven days a week with three crews. Um, and I don't know if Susan had asked a couple of questions a few minutes ago, and I think we were then talking about a crew at one at each end, so only two crews. And I know you're talking about different things at different times here, but has the timeline been refactored? And I can go back to the specific testimony and, and wording, but has it been re calculated with our village ordinances and our time breakdowns and 
And, and while it was three months as a target then, does the target change to something closer, something, something different if we're talking about adhering to village ordinances and, and not as many crews able to get in there? And I can go back to the specific t testimony. It was November 3rd if you need, if you need me to. I don't think they ever said seven days a week. I thought it was six days a week. Well, originally they had said seven and you, I believe, reminded them <laughs> that on Saturday it was seven, it was nine to one. And I, I can Never literally go back. And then I think it was me that said that there was no, nothing allowed to be, or maybe it was you on Sunday. And I think uh, Mr. Latinchus had said it impacts the contractor and it's a very difficult project it's not attractive to and they want to make it attractive to contractors our ordinances would limit which contractors would be open and receptive to this job and then i think we got sort of backlogged in that conversation you, i think what it was is tibor had said something along the lines and the contractor will not want to show up for half a day on saturday right yeah um right so I don't actually think we ever circled back around. Yeah, in fact, I see here we didn't. It literally, one of the next sentences was so moving on. Um, but <laughs> I mean, I think we were, it, impa it impacted the contract, how this was impacting the contractor and, and what, what we were shooting for was a timeline of three months. But that was seven to five. I think seven days a week, I'm not sure. Yeah, the, the premise, okay, the with Terms three was always, was always six days a week. We've learned that Saturday afternoon is not permitted under the ordinance. Um, the target, and this is an educated statement in that we have discussed this with capable, competent contractors, is three months. Now, could it be long? And as Mr. Rutherford, it is certainly in Hopper Ridge's interest to for it to move as quickly as possible. That being said, with, with if we have a week of solid rain, um, you'll we will lose a week. Um, what does the week of solid rain do to the drying out dredged material that we were just discussing that that does have to get dredged? If you have material sitting there drying and we have a week of solid rain are you back at square one with that drying process or are we just delayed equally on well, either end of that it's, it's well okay it's to uh properly compact soil it has to be at within a, a proper range of moisture content um but you know if we had rainfalls like yesterday yesterday was not a working day um so there will a lose time now. Uh, there, there are there are challenges here. The contractor, I, I, I'm a little concerned where this goes to. You know they, that after three months, if the wall is not finished, the, a permit is revoked. That is unreasonable. Um, our, the target is three months. Um, the uh, but there needs to be accommodations for the variables. Um, what I think everybody is getting at is because you, I mean, you did say when it was going to be six days a week, you did say I have in my notes that it was three crews as well. So now it doesn't seem like any company is going to have three crews. It seems that it has to be longer than three months if you're going to have. If 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 the board is, I, I think the board should should the resolution should. Uh, I, I don't think I'll defer to the attorneys. I don't think the resolution could put a time limit on it. No, I don't think so I either. Mean, there are, there, but... there are homes that go for construction for years. Sometimes unfortunate, but. I'm I'm a little um, I'm a little puzzled 
Um, I wasn't asking about a time putting a block, an end cap, an end date on the on it. I think we're just trying to get a realistic expectation exactly. of the length of time of the project because when we started talking, I'm sorry, I did go back and check. You're right. You were saying six days a week, seven to five, and we discussed it seven to five, seven thirty to five, and then only nine to one on Saturdays. And you had said it would be advantageous to the HOA to complete this project, to, to, to keep contractors working the entire Saturday. And, and we had said that that's not within our ordinances. I just think we're trying to get, we never circled back around to a recalculation of what it means okay. if we only have two crews working certain, certain limited time frames. So I, I think that's what we're trying. No one's putting an end cap, I don't think. Okay. I was just trying no, to get no, a better. Now, Ms. Huben and, and, uh, and uh, Committee uh, Woman Reynolds, the good questions in terms of um, the minimum crews. I mean, Tibor, would you say that you, it would be fair to put in a resolution a minimum of two crews? Uh, I don't. Yeah. Uh, no, I, 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 I just. Do you mind if I just jump in? I just. I, I don't think that that our intent is to hold the applicant. Or, or 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 leave him to the mercy of contractors, if you will. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be in that situation. And there's no, you know, the, there's no telling what happens with a contractor, especially in 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 COVID nineteen and today's environment. I was only asking that question from my perspective to to ascertain a best case and worst case scenario so the people in the neighborhood can better understand what you know look tibor the worst thing that happens is somebody says yeah our timeline is is six two months or three months and then five months down the road everyone's upset so if the best case is is three months and the worst case is five to six months that's all i'm asking because i don't want this to be surprise anyone. I want everyone to have a realistic expectation about what may or may not happen. I didn't mean to get into the weeds and I'm not suggesting that that any uh, approvals would be revoked uh, based on the availability of contractors. I, I mean, obviously that's not something we would want to do to an applicant. And as Mr. Rutherford has repeatedly pointed out, these are not just Ridgewood residents, they're our neighbors. I mean, they're a part of our community. So we're not looking to hurt anyone. I think we're just looking to establish a best case uh, and worst case scenario. Based on what could happen if there was one crew? What could happen if there was three crews? Right. And you had such good numbers. You were, you were so good at calculating those the first time. Um, I think you were very efficient at calculating that. So it just seems like if we're changing a few of these things that are sort of big key factors in it, maybe we could say to people, target three months, you know, hope for the best, expect the worst sort of a situation, but maybe a better time to, uh, table, like Susan is saying. Okay. Just one thing, Mr. Rutherford, just I, now that we're talking about time, I think you can agree with me that these conversations don't affect the required time to commence construction, correct? Yes, I mean, again, there's a whole host of regulations that deal with, you know, the expiration of permits and all those kinds of things. But, but I understand and I hear the board's concern. And I think what we can also do, and, and yeah, I mean, we're going to start as soon as we reasonably can, for sure. Uh, and I know the idea is to try to get this done in the early spring, as Mr. Latinchich mentioned. Uh, but I think we can, prior to the next meeting, uh, give the board a better um, idea of the best and worst case scenarios for duration of construction, perhaps linking that, you know, to some objective criteria, you know, how many, like Mr. Latinchik, for example, said earlier this evening, uh, a contractor can, in, in this situation, can lay 100 square foot a day. Okay, so we're talking about 6,000 square feet, that's 60 days, you know, so I think we can kind of come up with something that might give the board a little better comfort level, um, you know, based on those objective parameters, how much can be done each day, and how many crews you know, and all those kinds of things you know how many crews in and of itself doesn't mean too much unless you say well is it two guys on a crew five five persons on a crew what is it you know so i think we can come up with some objective criteria that might give the board a little better idea of what to expect that's perfect i think that's exactly uh, well, at least what i was trying to get at <laughs> Go ahead. sir 
anyone else from the public that has questions? Did anyone else raise the hand, Dylan? No, not during that period of time. Hey, Laura, I just had one quick question on the emergency access road from Cedar. How wide is that? The okay. well, Eastman itself is uh, 15 feet wide. Um, and the actual traveled way, it's variable, um, but it varies from nine to 12 feet uh, wide. Okay. The easement itself is 15 feet wide, which is, um, the same as a travel lane on a public roadway. And can you go back to those pictures one more time, just of the access road? Yes. And Tibor, while you're doing that, I just want to clarify to write this down. You said it varies nine feet to 12 feet. Other yes. areas 15 feet? The easement is 15 feet. Okay, but the actual road Physical passageway is nine to twelve, correct? Yes. Thank you. And one one further note on that. One further note on that. If I and I hate to interrupt, but I, as you can see also from the plan, the traveled way is not in all respects coincident with the easement, as well. So we just so the board's aware of that. The traveled way you'll see falls outside the of the easement certainly when it accesses from Cedar. Or I think primarily due to those trees that Mr. Latinchich mentioned earlier. Okay, yeah. Just so to be clear on the record, that's all. That's the only right. reason I say that. Photograph number 40 is the concrete curb cut and apron uh, leading. Um, I'm pointing to the right. twin sycamore tree where actually the travel way narrows down. So when a truck comes in through that and they have to avoid the sycamore tree, are they going to be driving on, I, th I think it's uh, Mr. Horvat's property? Yes, the, the, the uh, let me just check, the easement overlaps, yes, the easement is overlaps Mr. Horvat's property. Okay, and that fence is Mr. Horvat's fence? Yes. Okay, and then the fence on the other side, that cedar fence, is that? That's this fence here is Hopper Ridge's fence. That's the gate. Okay. That's photograph number 43. Um, this is actually the, the, double check my notes, but the easement is, I believe, coincidental with the 15 foot wide sanitary sewer easement. So this manhole is the center line of the 15 foot easement. And uh, clearly a smart truck tr driver is gonna straddle the manhole and not drive over the pipe as just as a practical matter. This structure here is the silt chamber, uh, but these are photographs. That's the gate for the access easement. Okay, keep it on that photograph for a second. So as the truck goes through, you see the tree straight ahead? Yes. Is there enough space between that tree and the fence on the left for the trucks to get through? Actually, I specifically showed that to the one construction super with that specific question, and the answer was yes. There we go, that's a better picture. That, that's a better okay. picture. Yeah, that's like more room. Okay. There's, uh, there's, there's plenty of room here um, for uh, a truck to... Uh... And again, that's Mr. Horvat's fence. Yes. Okay. And this is looking out. This is looking from well into the property, looking out towards uh, Cedar Avenue. The green chain link fence, vinyl coated, is Mr. Horvat's uh, fence. The cedar fence is the uh, Hopper Ridges uh, fence, and that's looking out towards Cedar Ave. Is there any plan to take down that cedar fence during this 
Yes, portions of that fence will, that uh, cedar fence will come down for access purposes. For that circular motion we were discussing. Uh, that's photograph number 40. Um, you can see there's plenty of room here for maneuvering trucks. Uh, oh, by the way, this is, uh, how did I? In fact, this is, I was referring to eroded areas. This entire bank here is in poor condition and is an ideal place to put some of that pond skimming. And this is the stockpile area. This area legitimately will need to be re topsoiled. This is the exact area where we will be looking to dry out any material removed from the mm -hmm. ponds and the exact area that we'll use to utilize that same material. And if you don't dredge the ponds, what are some of the negative consequences that would occur? Well, the well, yeah, the, the 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 ponds will slowly revert to uh, a wetland condition as they slowly silt in over over a period of time. The north upper pond will become more of an emergent wetland than, uh, um, than the pond. It's gonna silt in over time. Okay. And the benefit of dredging it is what? It, it remains a pond. Okay. How, how long it, would that approximately take? I'm sorry, Lorraine. That's okay. How long would it take for it to silt in over over time, I mean, is that 20, 30 years? Is that five years? Or, I mean, if that's not something you could get. Okay, I, um, again, many variables there. It's my understanding the pond was drenched, dredged once before to maintain its uh, condition. Um, it collects all everything that enters the municipal storm sewer system in the 60 upstream acres, ultimately, if it's not trapped by the silt chamber, it is passed into the pond. Um, over time, it will, um, it will uh, fill in and revert and, and go to uh, an emergent wetland. So I totally heard you say that a minute ago, but I was just wondering if there's any guess guesstimate or guess on how long is that? This pond has been there about 30-ish years. Is that Yes. So it was dredged once in 30 years. It hasn't silted in yet. And it didn't silt in before that dredging. So can we presume? I, I, cannot, I cannot give an opinion. OK, thank you. I appreciate that. Talking about the, the, the ponds, you have to expand the ponds. Yes. So how, how deep do you know how to dig where you're expanding it? OK, the are the, um, and yes, that will be, so that will be export. Um, the current plans are to, uh, I believe, three feet deep, uh, just to have a reasonable body of water. Um, we are considering, and that would be a discussion with DEP, to reduce that to perhaps as little as six inches. Uh, it'll be an emergent wetland. Uh, that, but that is, we are going to discuss that with uh, DEP. Um, let me. That is, I seem to remember, bear with me while I check some numbers here, I have to refresh my, um, that was a specific number of the pond excavation. Um, and uh, I have to check my notes here, please bear with me. It's Steve Board, take your time. I got a question, David, you said yeah. the, um, the travel way, some of the travel way is outside of the easement. Do you mean that some of the travel way is on the Hopper Ridge property? Is that what you meant? Well, Mr. Latin, I was, yes, it's not on the, it's on the Horbat property, Mr. Horbat's property. But as part of the easement? I think it goes, Mr. Latinchich can specifically answer the question. I believe that the roadway at a certain point falls outside of the easement. 
correct, Mr. Latinchic? Yes. Um, let me pull up that plan. Would you need a license for that, David? Well, it's I don't know. That's a good that's a good real property law question. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's been that way. For okay, so I'm going to zero in on that very specific area. Sewer line angles in there, so okay. Mr. Latinchich plan, I think, has a highlighted version of the. Okay, this is yeah, this is a highlighted version. Okay, the the green. This is the fifteen foot wide uh, sanitary sewer easement, which I believe is coincidental with the access easement, and I'm tracing the uh, western side of it and the eastern side of it. That's right. Uh, to be verified. Uh, the property line, I believe, is right down the middle of that 15-foot wide uh, easement property line to be verified by survey. I have not surveyed the Olcott or Horbot properties. Um, and then there's yet another easement. There is a drainage easement, a 10-foot wide drainage easement, which is offset from the sanitary sewer easement. Okay, but the and this is the drainage line that runs in that easement from the municipal drainage system to the silt chamber to the pond. Highlighted in yellow is the sanitary sewer, which is on the Olcott property outside the easement and running at this peculiar angle. And I would ask Chris to, you know, he may have different notes to verify this, but this is the sanitary sewers. In the, in the street, and we are presuming that that line runs to this next manhole. And then the gray shaded area is the traveled way of the easement because of this large double sycamore, which I'm tracing with my pointer. Everybody drove around the sycamore tree. So the traveled way um, which is somewhat of a prescriptive easement, um, is outside the deeded easement. Um, but by the time it enters the Hopper Ridge property itself is within the easement. I'm tracing the Horvat fence, that's the chain link fence. Um, that's in all the various photographs. Um, so a lot of information here. Um, this is the curb cut for the access easement, which does not necessarily line up with the deeded easement, all because of the sycamore tree. There will be no disturbance of the chain link fence. Is that fair to say? Correct. Yes. And if there's, do you, do you anticipate following a successful completion of this project that the easement travel way will return to its normal state or there would be a betterment? I, I anticipate a betterment. We do call at a minimum return to its existing state. I expect the contractor, we specify the, the beginning of this easement. We put down a, a wheel blanket of crushed stone uh, for all sorts of good reasons, erosion control, dust control, to protect the traveled way, to protect the uh, sycamore tree, a hundred foot long wheel blanket here. And you heard Ms. Bucci Carter's comment about a landscape architect that would factor in for the entire project, including this, yes? Uh, I would defer to Mr. Rutherford in that matter. Yeah, I'll talk with them and that being, uh, yes, I mean, I, I think we understand the need for landscaping, Mr. Martin, for sure. Uh, I will make in that regard. I, I do have one, Matt, one item to add to that. Um, we specify replacement plantings. Um, these are repair and, and to refresh everybody's memory, I believe the tree removal is 16 with 26 trees to be planted. And those, these are riparian zone um, trees. We are we require 
a permit from DEP for riparian vegetation disturbance. The village also has a riparian zone ordinance, which I will defer to Chris, Chris Ruderhauser, but to a large extent is patterned after the DEP standards, which is where they originated. The DEP is going to have a lot to say about the riparian zone plantings. There's going to be a preference for native indigenous riparian species, which is what we specify. I would suggest that the DEP be the lead review agency um, and their, their permit requirements be the, I'm struggling for the right word here, the lead agency. I don't want to have a situation or I would prefer not to have a situation where we're serving two masters. Uh, the DEP would like Swamp Oak and the landscape architect may have another preference. Um, one of our requests with this application is that the DEP be the lead agency in the review of the riparian zone disturbance and the riparian zone plantings, which is pretty much all our plantings. So how that gets integrated with the role of the landscape architect um, I defer to others, but I, I bring that to everybody's attention. I, I, I suggest, Chair, that Marianne chime in on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would work with Chris on that uh, for sure. But um, at, at this point, I mean, the DEP will be reviewing these plans regardless whether they're done, whether the landscaping is done by an engineer or landscaping is done by a landscape architect. So um, I don't think this, having a landscape architect do in, be involved and, and do the designs does not change the protocol of jurisdiction on any of this. So I, I, I don't think that's um, something to be concerned about. If it does- so I, In the areas that would be DEP jurisdictional, for lack of a better term, the landscape architect would need to use that as the standard in that area. Yeah, the, D, the, any, the landscape architect doing the design would need to follow all the regulations of the local ordinance and the DEP regs that are in place. So it's, 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 it doesn't, I don't see that there, it's an issue. So I have two questions. I'm sorry. If yeah, I, sure. Go ahead. <clears throat> so um, I just wanted to go back. I don't know. It's probably not a question Tibor can answer, um, but it's something that's worth exploring. That pond that is um, potentially silted up and becoming an emergent wetlands. Do, can we determine to the the percentage that it's currently? Um, Built it up. Is that the term you used? And and because I, I think the question is to dredge or not to dredge, and whether or not we allow it to continue. Is there? And maybe Chris can answer. Is there? How do we determine what percentage, and and how much time before it becomes, you know, like a wetland? And then the next question is that um, extended um, pond area that you just said about going only six inches. That would be troubling to me because that's like standing water, and and so I just wanted to ending that would that would to me create a six inch emergent wetland would create standing water that would be for me in my mind anyway a mosquito control issue because the deeper the water the less the, you just by nature you have more movement maybe you have you know, fish or something I don't know but it just would seem to me that that is a potential for um, you know, breeding ground for mosquitoes and, and other issues. So I don't know, is that something we should be uh, examining very closely? Chris, anyone? I don't know. Does, doesn't it have to be able to maintain the amount of water that it was 
first designed to? No, the to, the, to hold the design. Okay, there is the purpose of. I think the original developer had a, an aesthetic consideration with these ponds, but their stormwater management purpose is that there is stormwater storage above the normal water surface of these ponds, which is ultimately controlled by the outlet control structure in the lower southern pond. Yesterday, it was functioning. Um, there is no regulatory obligation to maintain a volume to these ponds. Um, now, interestingly enough, when you build detention basins today, DEP actually encourages them to be planted wetlands on the bottom of a detention basin as a as an environmental element. Um, you know, we know from the Wetlands Protection Act that wetlands are viewed as a positive by the DEP. Um, so uh, we are. We're going to discuss this um, again, and this goes to the truck traffic, which, you know, there's, there's always a give and a take here. Um, a three foot excavation of this pond expansion would be 322 cubic yards or 18, 18 truckloads export. Um, if some of that can be utilized on site, um, that would reduce that export. And again, utilize on site selectively, such as, you know, areas that are eroded on site, landscaping purposes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the, you know, we, this is why we originally looked into dredging the pond. And as we have investigated, disposal of that material is very expensive. Um, you know, unless there's participation with the Bergen County Mosquito Commission and the village. Um, Can I just ask, when was that all the way ruled out? I mean, our last meeting, we were taught, we were still factoring that all the way. And you just as answering a question to a resident about the, about the truckloads is when I and a couple other board members first became aware the dredging of the ponds is out of the discussion. Yeah, again, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to lose sight of my question. I don't want to lose sight of my question and have my question kind of be, be taken to a different place that it wasn't intended to be taken. So I wasn't talking about truckloads and trips or anything else. What I was asking was whether or not we can establish the percentage of silt or whatever it is, muck, silt, um, that would become a, a wetland, what percentage is the pond currently, I think the word was silted, what percentage of it is currently silted and whether or not it is penny wise, pound foolish to not dredge. And the, the second question was whether or not a shallow depth to another pond, and again, you know what, it, it, it's, it's fine to say, well, it's less truckloads and the DEP, our intent is to have the best outcome for everyone, not just the Hopper Ridge residents, but as you pointed out, for everyone, including the entire, the village, the other residents. So my two questions were, can we establish the percentage of silting that's occurred in that pond that now a decision is being made not to dredge? I'd like to understand that. And number two is whether or not a shallow, um, a shallow pond at that six inches as a an emergent wetland, whether or not that poses health risks to different neighbors in the terms of sitting water. Because in my mind, and I'm not an expert, in my mind, the greater the depth, the less likely it is to just be stagnant sitting water. That's my question. And I, and I guess the question could go to Chris or to somebody else. I, that's my question. It wasn't about how many trucks or, or, or trips or anything else. Those are two questions. Okay, well, I, can, I can certainly answer uh, the first part of that question. This is, anybody has on the screen, this is a survey of the existing pond. And um, this, is based, this is the extent of the pond today. The uh, southern and um, 
Western edges are riprapped banks. Um, and the, there is not an emergent wetland condition along the perimeter now. However, this pond is, this takes, it's, it's taking the brunt of the silt that passes beyond the silt chamber and, and it's the first pond and there's a choke point here so it all settles out. This pond is functioning as it was intended as a silt trap. Um, but knowing and, and there's a gentleman in the association who maintains the fountains in these ponds. He, he can, he, the, the depth of this pond is significantly less than the middle pond and more than and significantly less than the lower pond because the silt is, I think it's, this is only, I believe only two feet of water in this pond before you get to the silt. And over time, because it's getting the runoff from 60 acres, it will fill in over time. Um, knowing that, um, could this be an emergent wetland? This pond has been cleaned once already. Uh, it's it's uh, 30 years old now. I can certainly think 15 to 30 years from now, it'll be an emergent wetland. Right, so then the next question is, does a more shallow pond, the six inch that you're now suggesting, is that a, a potential for stagnant water that proposes other health risks? And that, that question, I guess, would be Chris, I don't know. I can answer that. Uh, the shallower the water, the warmer the water. The shallower the water, the more conducive it is to mosquito breeding. Uh, the mosquito breeding here is also affected by the runoff that passes through it because that disturbs the water. If it's always stagnant and doesn't have an inflow and outflow as these ponds do, you're going to have a greater propensity for mosquito production and populations. So I hope that answers the question. Unless, of course, you have particularly a stagnant water with a particularly dry season, you could wind up with a problem. Yes, if we had a like a summer that had several months of very, very dry weather, you probably would see the bottom of that pond very quickly. And then subsequently you would see the mosquitoes and the health detriments. So, and I'm asking that for a reason because I don't imagine that that six inch pond, a six inch depth is, is has, has a value. And I, I, I think that, that again, do, to, to do it as, as proposed is um, appropriate, even if it means a couple of extra truck trips. I, I mean, I just, just an opinion. I, I don't see that that we want to see like either stagnant water or a mud pit. Uh, you're absolutely correct. Um, this is very much a similar situation to what the village did with King's Pond, where we dredged that and the water quality has right. gotten significantly better. Uh, we do have a greater volume of flow Beautiful. through King's Pond. Um, mm -hmm. And as a side note from King's Pond, there were comments made about the dredging material being odiferous. Uh, I don't recall us getting very many, if any, complaints at all when we stockpiled the dredge spoil and had it dewatered before we trucked it away that it was stinky. So again, it depends on the organic matter. Mm -hmm. If it's yeah. mostly silt, it's less odiferous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, 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 sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no I was just going to say, was that? that when it was built, was it built to hold a certain amount of water? Was it paid well, for? It was designed for a certain quantity of water um, by the outlet control structure that Tibor mentioned. Uh, that governs how much the levels of water. Um, the level of water it holds over time has diminished by the inflow of sediment that has filled the bottom up, reducing the quantity of water that it can contain. <clears throat> but now they're expanding it. Should it be dug back down to the... Right. They're making it yeah, smaller. A well, deeper pond is better than a shallower pond because it just keeps the water cooler. Colder water is better for uh, pond health. 
Uh, this is it. I have this is the original. This is the final site plan for the uh, pond. I uh, trying to. Um, I don't think it calls out a depth. Uh, that that is the that is the original approved site plan. Um, it does not indicate a depth. What about the other ponds too? Because you're doing the same thing to the other. By moving the wall, you have to make them bigger, so you're going to dig them to the same depth. Okay. The okay the the pond expansion is not a depth question. It's a surface area question. Um, and Tibor, as you're doing that, I just want to say that while it doesn't call out a depth, it, there is a depth. There was a depth established. Right? Is that a fair statement? Not sure if I understand. Uh, yeah. so when, what you're saying is all, all the what I'm, you're saying the original site plan doesn't call out a depth. Yes. But right. But, clearly, the but by virtue were, of its existence. Yes, they, they clearly the ponds. So even though it doesn't, in other words, even though it doesn't call out a depth, a depth was established. Because now it exists. Yes. Yes. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Good. The uh, okay. the gray shaded areas are that portions of the ponds that are being filled to accommodate the wall construction. Um, and as a practical matter, uh, in the state of New Jersey. You cannot have an, a loss of regulated open waters. So the area that is being filled to accommodate the wall construction, including the lower wall, we are expanding the pond in round numbers 29, I believe it's 2,900 square feet, 2,900 square feet. That is that deep blue shaded area in the upper pond. And part of our thought process for the, that yes, as this is, there's a lot, there's many benefits to expanding the North Pond. It's the smallest pond. It's where the silt naturally collects. The, has good access. All those factors were taken into consideration in the expansion of the North Pond. But ultimately it is a surface requirement, not a depth requirement. Not a gallonage requirement? No. The stormwater storage. What was that, what was that last question? I, no, I said it's not a gallonage requirement. It's not enough. The, the lower not, pond is deeper than the upper pond. So if you take 10 feet away from the lower pond, and you no, just no, add no, 10 feet to the, the upper storm, pond. The stormwater storage is that which is above the normal water surface area. The airspace above the, the normal water surface is what was used yesterday for storm for runoff storage. So the requirement and the obligation is to maintain that same surface area of pond available for stormwater storage. It, what, what's considered a pond? Six inches deep to... Oh, okay. I, um, uh, the, the, the generically called detention uh, ponds, detention basins. Um, actually, it's called a basin on the approved plan, but I'm not going to, it is a legitimate question. Um, and uh, we will discuss that with DEP. So DEP will regulate the size, the depth, the Yes. Everything. 
could also establish the depth. We, we have that that right as well, don't we? we can we stipulate, stipulate that it has to be dredged or it has to be a certain depth or? Right, I mean, uh, why couldn't, why, why would we, the DEP might have a depth and we might stipulate a depth as well. I mean, nothing prevents us from saying that we don't, you know, a six inch depth isn't, you know, what, what's appropriate and establish our own depth, no? I'm gonna suggest that there may well be some preemption issue here, but I won't comment on that right now. That still comes to mind. A comment without a comment, right, David? <laughs> I guess so. I saw an issue at least. I didn't know the answer, but I saw the issue. There you go. <laughs> okay. And then, David, another question. I mean, uh, Chris and Tibor and Marianne, David might add how long must pass in time for a pond to dry up and it's not considered directly caused by the construction and therefore losing the entire surface? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either. I, I don't know as you asked me that question, I'm sorry. I guess that comes back to the question of when did it come off the table as part of the plan and like who made that decision, the overall decision? I think I, I, I can say that the dredging came off the plan simply because the Hopper Ridge has no ability or resources to do that. It's right, I think all along it had been a question that the village might have to chip in, but did the village and, and Hopper Ridge or you guys ever have that discussion? No. Okay. No, there has been no discussion with the village uh, about that. Um, and as you're all well aware, certainly, you know, this pond is, a, is, is, a, is an important fact, is important part of the village's yes. stormwater management system, you know, collecting some 62 acres. Uh, as it did yesterday. So yes, no, there has been no discussion there. The reason the dredging came off the table is that Hopper Ridge, you know, clearly does not, obviously does not have unlimited funds and there's no, there's no funds available for that. Thank you. Thank you. I had, I had been curious about that as that got discussed. Thank you. Okay. Uh, does anyone from the public, we'll, we'll come back to them uh, a third time just to see if anyone else has questions in the public. You can just raise your hand and then Dylan will let you in. Anyone, I'm not seeing any, any hand raised. Oh, we got one, we got one. All right, Mr. Hobart, bring them in right now. Yes, yeah, so, um, um, T bar showed a picture of that tree uh, close to Cedar Avenue and and our property. I'd like to see that again. It shows the curved line that would require them to actually drive on our private property, and they sound like this is fine. That uh, that's acceptable, but it's not acceptable. And they and they claimed that that had been used before. They never used that easement when they constructed Hopper Ridge, and they never used it uh, any time since then. I mean, you can clearly see the line around that tree, and that they would have to encroach on our private property. Do you have any other questions for uh, Tibor? More of a question format. I just like you, Tibor to confirm that. Okay, Tibor. Okay. The traveled way of the access route where it leaves the, the municipal roadway and the curb cut to service that traveled way it is outside the 15 foot easement because of the sycamore tree. Um, and yes, Which that is on our private property. That that is that that traveled way uh, is on your property. Yes, but that was never used previously to this. But you're assuming that it's okay to use it now. Okay. The over our property. Okay. Um, okay. The 
Okay, clearly I don't live next to the easement. It is my understanding that this access easement has been utilized on a routine basis by the public, landscapers, uh, the village for maintenance purposes, et cetera. No, that, no, no, no. that is not, that is I, not I, correct. I, I, no, I, uh, uh, point of order. Um, all right, just you ask the question. He's going to give his answer. Uh, you, you don't enter into a dialogue. You're going to have um, public testimony and, and public comment uh, within this uh, application. So you can voice, you know, certain sentiments at that time. Thank you. But, you I, but your point is being conveyed that, you know, that you, it's your property and you don't want someone going on it. And he acknowledged that, uh, you know, it goes on your property. Thank you. Any other question for Tibor? Robert? No, I said thank you very much. Um, no, no further questions. Okay. All right. A anyone else in the public to ask questions? I am not showing any other hands okay. raised. Uh, Dave, did you have any other uh, witnesses? Not this evening, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, should we break it off at this point, I guess? Um, yeah, we have some work to do, Mr. Chairman, to address the concerns raised by the board this evening. Um, I won't go through them now. I've made some notes. I will be providing a transcript as well. Um, so we'll do our, our best to respond to those prior to the next meeting. And we'll try to do that expeditiously with some redirect from Mr. Latinchich. And then I guess it would be time for, then we could hear from the public as well at the next meeting I would anticipate. Okay. Uh, were you carrying this over to the 15th or did you want to? Uh... I think, no, the 15th isn't, I don't think the 15th is time enough. That's only okay. two weeks. Yeah. Uh, so I guess our next one would be uh, January 5th or 19th. I think January 5th would be okay, Mr. Chairman. Jane, do we have anything on for that date? That okay. Um, if I, if I, I may have a, that is a Tuesday, no, January 5th. Okay. That's the first Tuesday of the month? That's correct. Yep. Okay, I may have a conflict that evening. Um, what about the uh, 19th? Okay, is, uh, as we're all juggling uh, schedules, uh, what's wrong with December 15th? Um, uh, There's another application, Tibor. Okay. Um, well, actually, my... Is my testimony complete? And questions? Uh, I think we're going to have, we're going to need a little bit more from you. Um, why don't we, I just don't think the, the 15th, the, I know the board has another application, but also it, it takes a little time. You know, I need to get the transcript and we need to respond in an orderly way. I'm not looking to drag this out. I can certainly know that my client is anxious to get this done. Maybe we could carry it to the fifth and we'll just see how it works out for, with, for Mr. Latinchich with respect to his conflict. Yes, and then I would ask, I, I have to juggle another planning board meeting that evening, <laughs> um, which we carried because of tonight. <laughs> um, so I ask for any cooperation and courtesies in that regard. Um, All right, well, we'll carry it to January 5th. And we'll see how it goes. Uh, Dave, I guess you can let us know if it's, uh, there's a conflict uh, for Tibor and you need to push it back. But we'll just put it for uh, January 5, That's fine. 2021, without further notice, and without prejudice to the board. That's fine. Maybe we can somehow coordinate his appearance as well. And I, I appreciate that's difficult to do, but. OK. All right. All right, and yeah, with no prejudice, obviously an extension of time through January 5th, 2021. Okay. Actually, the Zoom meetings may 
make it possible to do two planning board meetings in one evening. <laughs> um, okay. All right, so uh, thanks, Dave, for the presentation. And uh, I guess we'll you. see you back on this one, January 5th, hopefully. Thank and you all for your time this evening. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Good Thank you. Too. Thank you. Good night. All right, our next item will be adoption of minutes for November 3, 2020. Whoever was present on that date is available to vote on them. I guess uh, um, Fran was the only oh, one out there. Yeah, right. I'll make a motion to approve as submitted. Okay, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, do you have a second? All right, call the roll. Okay, Mayor Newton. Did I say Susan? yes? Susan? Yeah, okay, I didn't hear you. Okay, Chief McGore? Yeah. Yes. Councilman Reynolds? Where is Lorraine? Is she gone? Um, okay, Mr. Joel? Yes. Ms. Huban? Is she gone too? Gone. Oh. <laughs> um, Ms. Pateri? Yes. Um, Ms. Westner? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Yes. And Mr. Lubarski. Yes. Lorraine is back, by the way, Jane. I'm back. I lost my connection. Okay. <laughs> uh, we just had a vote on the uh, minutes for November. Mm -hmm. I, could hear, I could hear everything that was going on, but you <laughs> couldn't hear me. <laughs> I'm like, I'm here. Melanie's back in too. I don't know what happened to me either. I just was suddenly gone. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> yes, my vote was yes for the minutes. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So no, it's yes. All right. They're approved. <laughs> Okay, is there any other, uh, any need for an executive session, Chris? Not yet, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are you trying to scare us? Uh, all right, any further business, like anybody? 30 of them when COVID's over. <laughs> any further business? Do we have a motion to conclude? Okay, a motion by Mel, <laughs> we have second. Darlene, second. all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we're concluded. All right, great. Good night. Thanks, guys. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Dylan. Thanks, Dylan. Anytime. Thanks,